is here to break it down. So, Sam, this sounds like it's going to be one busy holiday weekend and, and not beyond. Likely a one for the record books, Al. And first of all, congratulations to you. Congratulations to Chanel. Congratulations to Craig also for just being an all-around great guy. Sorry that we couldn't be there to celebrate. That's in right. Person. Everybody's got to get an award. But as far as the, I know, I know. We're definitely living in those days. Um, let me just say this though: whether it is planes, cars, cruises, buses, trains, it doesn't matter. All of the numbers right now are up, guys, for AAA. As they look at this forecast, 10-day forecast, really, from before Christmas through after New Year's, they are projecting the second highest total of travelers since the start of the century. But even so, there are ways to get around the travel mess without too much stress. Tis the season for holiday travel madness. And a new report says this year will be one of the busiest on record. AAA projects a staggering 115 million U.S. travelers will venture 50 miles or more from home this holiday season. That's two and a half million above what we saw last year, racing through terminals and jamming roadways, and the second highest year-end travel forecast since AAA began recording it in 2000. Airports expected to be their busiest ever this Christmas and New Year's season, with an estimated 7.5 million travelers flying, surpassing 2019's record. There's nothing to Chicago? There's nothing to Chicago, New York, Nashville, you name it, everything's gone. But forget home alone level hysteria. The travel booking app Hopper says even with surging volumes, airlines are prepared. Airlines have done a lot of work to rebuild their fleets and get prepared for the busy holiday week. So heading into the holidays, airlines are prepared and ready for potential delays and cancellations. Some customers feeling sticker shock from the cost of a trip home. From Austin to New York, it's almost $1,000 to fly home for Christmas, which is crazy. But one piece of holiday cheer, AAA says average plane ticket prices are actually slightly lower than last year. So what can you do to navigate the crowds? The busiest days to fly are Thursday the 21st and Friday the 22nd, so leave extra time on those days. Take the earliest flights out if possible, as they're usually the least likely to be delayed. And remember, for a fee, TSA PreCheck and Clear will help cut down on security line chaos. Gas prices also down, just in time for that trip to grandma's house. But if you're planning on hitting the road this holiday season, drivers could see travel times up to 20% longer this year, with Saturday, December 23rd and Thursday, December 28th, expected to be the most congested days to drive. If you are going to hit the road, guys, the best time to do so is either before noon or after 7 p.m. So we just mentioned the 23rd and the 28th are rough. December 30th is also bad, too. Just keep that in the back of your mind. As far as the busiest airports, the three busiest, according to Hopper, Atlanta, Denver, and Dallas. Wow. Back to you okay. guys. All right. Hopefully you get to stay put, Sam. <laughs> no, in beautiful Miami. <laughs> Not going anywhere. Exactly. Good, good, good. We're Excellent. trying to get there. Hey, by the way, uh, speaking you, of Sam. travel, uh, here's a picture postcard live picture from Burlington oh, wow. Vermont look at wow. that it is snowing there they got a little uh, they'll probably pick up another two three inches of snow but it is gorgeous it is of course that also reminds you that that winter is here yeah. and you're going to start thinking about those heating bills well it is getting heated in our consumer confidential Vicki Wynn here to help us lower those energy bills this winter including the ideal temperature to set your thermostat if you're a dad you already know what it is <laughs> third hour of today we'll be right back Look at that.
are back, and we're back with a uh, money-saving consumer confidential, how to lower that heating bill. According to the Department of Energy, heating your home accounts for nearly 30% of your total utility expenses. Wow. So even a little savings can go a really long way. NBC News consumer investigative correspondent Vicki Wynn is here with some some strategies. So good morning. before we dig into to, to the strategies here, you maintain there is some good news when it comes to our energy costs right now? There's some really good news. The U.S. Energy Information Administration, Craig, is predicting that for the folks who use natural gas, that's about 46 percent of households in the U.S., they could save 15 to 25 percent on their heating bills because energy prices are lower for natural gas. If you live on the West Coast, NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, they say it's going to be warmer winter this year for folks on the West Coast, so lower bills there. For the rest of us, your energy bill should be somewhere within 5% of the cost of last year. So good news. Let's let's start with a the thermostat yes. because in, in my house it's it's always it's always a battle. You have the ideal temperature, Look, and I hope Lindsay Melvin is watching or listening right now. Many a war. The I'm with you, Lindsay. First of all, let's just make that clear. Yeah. But many a war has been waged over the thermostat. Yes. The first thing you have to consider is where is it in your house? It should be in a well-used area away from drafty windows and away from direct sunlight because that's going to trigger it unnecessarily and that's raise your point. energy bills. Now. The Department of Energy says 68 to 70 degrees is ideal in the winter. Well, we know Craig loves it like it's a meat locker and yes. you're in charge. <laughs> but you're supposed to even lower it 7 to 10 degrees at night or when you're away at work. That's if you're really after energy efficiency. If you're after comfort, I think a lot of women would say 68 to 70 is a little too cold. Uh, the key and the easiest thing to do to set it and forget it is really to invest in one of those yeah. Nest or smart programmable thermostats. They'll do it for you automatically. And that is a way to save 10 to 15 percent on your energy bill. All right. The anniversary boy is with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Vic, the big thing besides doing this is also making sure your house is nice and snug as far as it's sealed up. It is so important to protect your home against all those drafts and leaks because that's where the money is really just floating out the door. So you can start with your windows and your doors and also those cupboard spaces, the areas where plumbing enters your house. Mm -hmm. This is the time to invest in weather stripping and caulking. Right. Curtains, heavy curtains over your windows, just keep those closed at night. That'll make a difference as well. We talked about insulation in the attic. If you find a lot of draft coming from the attic, mm -hmm. it might be time to invest in a little more insulation right. and it will pay off over the next few years. And then finally, the fireplace is one of those inefficient areas in our home. If you don't use it, definitely keep the damper closed. Yeah. Consider buying one of those plugs. You can actually oh, yes. plug it up that's, that's, or convert it completely to gas. That's, that's right. the way you're going to save also, the most. I find some of those uh, window films that you can put on and, and just use a, a hair dryer to, yeah. on your window. That'll tighten Easy it up. Easy to pick up at Home Depot. Maintenance is one of those things that a lot of us forget about. Yes. So air filters. When's the last time you kind of thought about that? There, You have an air filter for your furnace and also one for your air conditioning system. Mm -hmm. You want to replace that every three months, generally, maybe more if you mm -hmm. have pets or a lot of dust in your home, and depending on the thickness of that filter, you just need to check the manual, and it'll tell you how often to replace it. Also, consider getting a home energy audit by the professionals just to make mm -hmm. sure everything is functioning as it should. The other thing is if you've got one of those radiator heaters or baseboards, sure. keep it clear, keep clothes and furniture away. Not only is it hazard, but it's making right. those things work that much harder. Mm -hmm. And then, yes, if you go to your energy company, not only will they give you a free energy audit in some cases, they'll even sell you discounted LED bulbs and mm -hmm. other items that can help bring down your bill overall. And that yearly professional check also includes the, the physical uh, part of your furnace, Absolutely. things like that. Yes, exactly. To make sure that's okay. And that can and really do it help. now do because be, before <laughs> it gets too cold and people right. are And then everybody's calling. Right. Yeah, exactly. So you've done the maintenance, yeah. you've done the seal, You've checked your thermostat. Let's talk about some everyday hacks All right. that people can do. Chanel, the best and free, most free, simple source yes. of energy for us is the sun. So if you have a house that faces the south, keep those I curtains agree. open all yep. day long. Let, Let it that warm up. Out. Yep, absolutely. Your ceiling fan, this one, turn it clockwise in the winter. That will circulate the warm air from the top down to the house. Does that really work? When you're looking up, going clockwise. Yeah. Absolutely okay. it does. Counterclockwise in the summer. Your water heater, it's probably set at 140 right now. Turn it down to 120. You won't miss it at all. Okay. And then finally, with your Christmas lights, this is important. If you can switch from incandescent to LED, you could save 40% okay. on 40%? Those. Yeah, Christmas light bills. Okay. Turning down the water heater, huh? Yeah. I know. That's Do you right. know what yours is set at, Craig? No clue. Mm -hmm. yeah, because no. you shouldn't be taking hot, really showers scalding anyway. hot showers right. anyway. Exactly. So it's safer. Great tips. Thank, Thank you. I love it. Just ahead, we got a motivational Monday. You're going to meet a chef on a mission, how he is helping men rebuild their lives through pizza. And then, literally hot off the presses with a Golden Globe nomination hey! for Best Supporting Actress, actor Rosamund Pike is here live, filling us in on her new movie. Third hour of today, we'll be right back. Congratulations, Rosamund. So exciting.
We are back on this Motivational Monday with the life-changing mission behind a Philadelphia pizza shop. I got to see for myself how they're serving up square slices and second chances. What God puts together, let no man tear asunder, except with my teeth. Oh, man, I'm gonna need that voiceover for the mixtape. Growing up in West Philadelphia, Chef Michael Carter was always cooking alongside his grandmother. You know, he who's in the kitchen gets to taste it first. Ah. <laughs> but his plans to attend culinary school were derailed when he found himself behind bars, convicted for armed robbery and sent to a juvenile detention facility at 16 years old. You were getting in some trouble. What was, what was happening? Me and my mother, we basically, we weren't getting along and I ended up getting kicked out. So I kind of ended up running the street. What do you remember of that time? You know, if you don't work, you don't eat. So I had to do a couple things that ended up on the other side of the law. From there, Mike spent a total of 12 years in and out of incarceration, convicted for various felonies. But he always managed to find work in the prison kitchens. Is that where you start actually developing kitchen skills? That was the first place I ever understood a culinary kitchen outside of the kitchen that I was raised in. So now I'm understanding how to do culinary math because instead of just cooking for, say, me and my siblings, now I'm cooking for everybody on grounds. And then once I was in the penitentiary, I'm cooking for 2,000 people a day. With the dream of a cooking career still burning bright, he trained in culinary management after his release in 2013. What was it about food that you realized, I can feed people and I can make money? And they say, do what you love to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I love to eat and I love to cook. It just made absolute sense. Mike working his way up in kitchens and catering companies all over Philadelphia until he was introduced to Muhammad Abdul Hadi also formerly incarcerated and looking to open a pizza shop with a purpose. Playing pies and saving lives. Down North is a mission-based for-profit pizzeria where every single one of my guys is a father. They're all returning citizens. People often say, do your crime, do your time. And then these guys come home to no resources, no jobs available. So how are they actually going to be the men who they are? Down North Pizza is hoping to improve upon Pennsylvania's nearly 65% recidivism rate by exclusively hiring formerly incarcerated men. We big on the resources here. They have access to a lawyer. We have housing for our guys. If we can't house you, we can point you in the right direction. So we have guys that we actually have placed in kitchens throughout the city. Mike serving as both executive chef and role model of the restaurant's purpose. Myself as well as our founder and every single employee that I have has been through it. But they didn't let that define them. They used it as either motivation or they used it as inspiration to move on to the next step in their lives. All while conjuring up school lunch, pan pizza nostalgia with each of his funky square slices. Tell me about the menu. We don't have a menu, we have a track list. It's basically the soundtrack to our youth in Philadelphia. And with the youth on his mind, Mike started a new program for inner city kids with a cooking class at the Philadelphia Juvenile Justice Services Center, hoping to lay the groundwork towards a different future for the next generation. We're actually teaching these kids how to cook, getting them involved. We actually have a healing garden there too. They get to grow the food. And in my class, you get to cook the food. So it's like a farm to table situation. Mm -hmm. So you're using food in a way to get them to come out of their comfort zone. Exactly. Try something out of the box and that may potentially be good for you. What do you hope kids take away from your classes? I just want them to be open to a different life than they were born into. I'm hoping my class serve as a key to open up that door to actually leave your neighborhood and see what you really can become once you explore the world. I tell you, oh, this I, is great. It, it, first of all, the pizza first of all, is first class. Delicious. Yes. I mean, I, I, I'm not a big thick, you know, crust pizza this fan. Is this is magnificent. Yeah. And, and hit Mike, Chef Mike and his team, they've built this community of fathers. He told me coming together is like therapy for them. So uh, huge thanks to everybody at Down North Pizza and the Juvenile Justice Center. Uh, because, listen, a lot of a lot of people have, have found their redemption through yes. food mm -hmm. and, and moved on and have done great things. But this is precisely why I'm Second chances are paramount. Mm -hmm. Paramount. Because mm -hmm. now look at this. Yeah. And again, it's delicious. Yes. Way to so go, Mike. Thank you. All right. Thank All right. you. Thanks for having us. I didn't know. Chef Mike wait, is here. Are you here? I didn't know Chef Mike oh, was wait, here. Oh, wait, I didn't know you were here. What? Oh. Wait, come hey. on. Over. Come on over, Chef Mike. 
Is that how we got these pizzas? Yeah, he, he must brought have brought the them pizzas in. Come on in. We didn't know you were here. Yeah, oh, man, I popped good. in and had to make some this pizza for you. Oh, my oh, goodness. Hi. hi. <laughs> my God. What's up, man? Huh. So no, this is been, where are you guys located in Philly? Where? 2804. Here, turn around so we can so people can see you. Yeah, you're where are you? Uh, 2804 West Lehigh Avenue. Okay. Uh, North Philadelphia, North Strawberry Philly. Mansion section, the heart of the city. Oh, you're he didn't right waste there. a shot. He didn't you're waste right a right shot. Good. Good. All right. Good. Good. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Chef Delicious. Mike. We appreciate it. Thank Still you, to come. Thank we you. got congratulations in order. Rosamund Pike is here live in the studio filling us in on her new film that just earned her a Golden Globe nomination. And later, we're going to toy around with your holiday gift guide. Going to share gifts for kids of all ages, like the little DJ oh, in your life who wants to drop the mic. That's third cool. hour, not chef mic, but drop the mic. <laughs> third hour today, right back. It is a big morning because our next guest was just nominated like about a half hour ago for a Golden Globe Award for her new film, Saltburn. Rosamund Pike first broke out on screen in 2002, playing double agent Miranda Frost in the Bond film, Die Another Day. And then she went on to earn a, an Oscar nomination for her role as Amy Dunn in the 2014 film, Gone Girl. Of course, she played opposite Ben Affleck in that one. Now, well, now she's back. She's back on the screen in this new comedic thriller. It's called Saltburn. It's the story of an Oxford student struggling to find his place who befriends Felix, the school's heartthrob. Rosamond plays Felix's mom, Elspeth, a former model and socialite who loves to bring up her past. <laughs> mm. Oh, this song. God, I haven't heard this song in forever. <sighs> I used to hang out with them all, actually, when I was modeling. Britpop, Blur, Oasis. God, the parties. Oh, but then, of course, common people came out and everybody thought it was written about me, which was completely mortifying and ridiculous. I mean, I barely knew Jarvis. What? But she came from Greece. She had a thirst for knowledge. It couldn't have been me. I've never wanted to know anything. Uh, I love it. Rosamund, good morning. <laughs> good morning. I Thanks feel like we've said on. it 72 times, but we're going to say it for a 73rd. Congratulations. <laughs> nominated for a Golden Globe. Best performance. Morning. Yeah, by a female actor um, in a supporting role in a motion, any motion picture. Uh, how are you feeling? Well, I just landed in New York last night, and then I was in the middle of looking for a lint roller and working out what <laughs> shoes to wear. Yeah. And, um, and, and uh, my publicist, who was in the room, just said, how, did, how would you feel about a little Golden Globe nomination this morning? I was like, you what? It's got to be amazing. <laughs> um, so it was an amazing feeling. And I, I mean, we had the film was such a special experience. We got on incredibly well with the, as, as a cast. Emerald Fennell is a, is a force of nature. She wrote it, directed it, and we would have kind of walked through fire for her. So, awesome. you know, it, it was a special one. And so. one of your co-stars got nominated. And Barry Keoghan got nominated too for a really dark, thrilling, amazingly twisted genius performance. It, yeah. I, I was just telling you, I started it last night. Um, we don't want to give away too much, but it, it's it's a bit of a mind bender. Like, yes. like it's, 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 it's kind of hard to describe. So I won't try. I'll let you. Um, but it's about, you know, privilege, desire, and, and... Emerald's very interested in, in obsession. And I think the, the, the British upper class system is something that 
people the world over remain obsessed with, mm. whether it's the royal family or the kind of level beneath them. Because I think it's, it's a world which you cannot gain entry to. Yes. You can't have it. However rich you are, if you can buy a mansion... It's a good way to put but it. ...but you can't have that. And, and because of that, it's, it's, it continues to obsess people. Mm. So for us all to play it and mm. inhabit it, we, we filmed in one house, this house you just can't even believe the size of it. As you saw it in the back yeah. of that clip. And one family lives in it. Wow. And they open their doors and let us film in every room. I actually lived in the house. Oh. So, so I kind of fell deeply into character, uh -huh. did nothing for, you know, apart from act, for wow. sort of the entire time. I mean, didn't leave the grounds. I realized after four weeks that I hadn't actually set foot in the real world. Wow. How large is, is and the then house? I realized, I, I, mean, I, I mean, it must have... I mean, I have no idea. It must have 60 bedrooms, I yeah. would wow. think. I mean, in the film, it's, it's it easily huge. like 30,000 square I actually feet. have no idea. It, I, I, yes, I, 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 did. I will find out. Yeah. 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 Before yeah. I do another interview, yeah. I will yeah. find out. That's right. We'll, we'll get on <laughs> Zillow and find it's out. It's just big, you know. I mean, yeah. these people don't, yes. don't, you know, exact square footage yeah. would probably They probably don't even know. That's true. Exactly. It's more about but, acreage, I think. You know what's interesting? When you talk to a lot of actors, they say one of the fun things is to play evil. Your character, Elspeth, is, is more... Uh, shallow. It, you know, it, it's really shallow. Really shallow. <laughs> I mean, not even close to the deep end of the pool. No. How, no. <laughs> what, is, it, is it fun playing shallow? It is because she likes to think of herself as a very um, caring, interested, clever person. But actually, clever people bore her. Um, and if, if anyone goes on about anything for too long, it's tedious. So really, she likes to remain very, very superficial. And, you know, I'm afraid it's, if you've ever spent any time in, in England, a lot of people are like that because it's just easier. It's easier not to feel or to think too deeply. And, um, you know, so I do find it fun because I think I am, me, Rosamond, I, I am a deep thinker and I tend to do a lot of research for roles. I've just been playing a paramedic. And so I've been out with the London Ambulance Service and I've been going deep into the world of you know, of, of being a paramedic, which is, mm -hmm. but, but for Elspeth, I had to do nothing apart from sort of look up a few new cocktails and, <laughs> you know, go on vacation. So. Really, you said something recently that, that caught our attention, and I want to make sure I get it right, because you said that you, quote, always felt like an outsider mm. in an interview recently. You said that. What did you mean by that? Because why I'm an actress. Of, well, but I think a lot of folks would find that surprising. You've had such professional success. I think I always feel like the alien in the room, if I'm honest. I think it's, it, I never feel like I'm on the inside. And unless I'm in a company of actors, you know, where, where you, that, that, that's my, you know, group of like-minded people. Yeah. But, the, but in, you know, going to a party, going into, I, I've never felt like I mm. belong. Really. I hope you feel affirmed and seen and all the special <laughs> things now. But I'm happy with yeah, that. I'm okay. happy with the outsider great. position now. Yeah. You know, as a teenager, it's tough. But now yeah. I kind of, I think that's where you get the angle from which to observe life and yeah. therefore replicate it on screen. And we could start by saying congratulations and in the same way. It's <laughs> going well, Rosman. <laughs> thank thanks you so much. Thanks for being here. Thanks for Never an outsider here. Buddy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Salt, you burn. Saltburn. It's in theaters now and it's on Prime Video December 22nd. All right. Now, when we come back, we're going to put a little roar into your holidays. We're going to share the best toys for every age in this morning's <laughs> yes, holiday yes. gift guide. You maybe come over, Rosamond, and do, do a little shopping for us with us. Uh, third hour today, I'll be right back. See you.
right, public service announcement. Christmas, two weeks from today. Of course, we're also celebrating Hanukkah right now. And if you're if you're still looking for some fun ideas, we're gonna we're gonna talk toys in this morning's holiday gift guide. Grace Bastidas is editor in chief of Parents. And she is here with their picks for some of the best toys of the year, huh? Yes, exactly. Let's start with babies. Yes, we considered nearly 200 toys, so I've brought you some of our top favorites. So this is the gun, My Little Food Truck oh, Playset, so and it engages babies, all of their senses, and the little uh, taco crinkles, the that. burger squeaks, the so boba cute. tea is a rattle, and it all fits mm. ne neatly inside the food truck. That's very I love nice. that. Throw I love it away. That. And then you can put the, the things away so they're not everywhere. Yes, That's yeah. it. exactly. Well, there you go. Craig's engaged. I'm like, uh, <laughs> we're all fascinated by this for your toddler yes. or for an adult. The Fisher-Price Mix and Learn DJ table. So babies and toddlers will love the lights, the sounds, the piano keys. It plays over 100 songs, and parents can even they can even record a sweet message that gets mixed. Look at Roger on the ones and twos. Remix in, into a song, yes, that's cute. So the best part is it grows with your baby. You attach the legs when your baby's ready to DJ their first part. Very that's cool. cute. Get up and DJ. These scooters seem to be very popular. Why? What sets them apart from others? Yeah. So this is the Crayola okay. Kick Scooter, and it's a hit with preschoolers. So okay. it comes with stickers so kids can customize their ride. Cute. A little carry case for crayons because you never know of when course. inspiration <laughs> will strike. <laughs> they're just cute. And they're adorable. And, and I like it because it's sturdy. Adjustable handlebars and three I mean, light wheels. I can't not ride it. Oh my God, please don't you fall would. I can't not ride it. Oh, no. Serious. But it, it's sturdy. It's got the two in the front. About to find out how sturdy it is. All right. And go. See now? That was fun. Yeah. All right. Uh, everybody has their music. Breath. Supports 200 pounds, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all? This, this oh, oh, ow. <laughs> this is you mega, to celebrate 45? The Mega Blocks Musical Farm Band, and it has 45 pieces that toddlers can use to Cute. build farm animals and practice those fine motor skills. So there's a cow drum. A so you build the phone. instrument? You build the little instruments, and it comes with oh. color-coded color music sheets of nursery rhymes That's that they cute. can play. This seems like it's Grace, older. what is it? Yeah. So what this is, is yeah. one of my favorites. It's great for open-ended play, and it's the Ocean Creatures Clixo Pack. It has 24 pieces, including fins and ten tentacles, and it turns into glow-in-the-dark sea creatures. Oh, my son You just bend, this. twist, wow. and snap Dylan the magnets just got a new into present. place. And it's made from recyclable material, That's cute. lightweight, and portable. That's cute, and you have to be creative about it. You, you have to be creative. Creative, exactly. I love that. I love, I love these that. Bags. All right, last but not least, you know, dinosaurs yes, are always a hit. Yes, Jurassic World yeah. Transformers. This is a two in one toy for ages this. eight and up. Turns into this. And it goes from being a roaring dinosaur into a rumbling vehicle in 28 steps. That's which cute, though. It I mean, that's a lot of steps. Of, but it's kids, a lot of steps, but you know what? Kids will get a yeah. lot of satisfaction when they you. master them. That's really cool. Grace, thank you. That's a win. Thank, thank you for having me. Especially thank the you, Grace. Congrats again. Thank, oh, thank yes. you very much. If you would like more information on any of these products, you can check out our website, today.com slash gifts. And of course, just a reminder, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases that are made through our links on today.com. All right, up next, the Monday Start Today workout to get your week started off the right way. All you need is four minutes today. Clear out some space wherever you are this morning and we'll show you how to do it. We come right back, four minutes.
right, let's get ready for a Monday morning start today workout. We're going to break a sweat with some simple exercises we can all do in a matter of minutes. Akeem Emmons is a coach with Smart Home Gym Tonal. Joining us uh, with two of our interns who are going to help us out Kayla today. And Sakina. We've got Shakina yeah. and Kayla. Yes. Hi, guys. guys. <laughs> all right, here we go. Okay, so how do we get this started? What, what, what's the point of four? How do you do get a, to a whole workout in four minutes? Yeah. First and foremost, you've hired a professional. My okay. name is Coach Akeem Emmons, and I think that the big myth is that we need a lot to do a lot. So yeah. today we're just going to utilize our body weight. Okay. We're going to be working for time. Okay. We're going to get a full body workout within Wait, four minutes. My goal it. is for you guys to break a sweat. If you don't, the $20 bet that we made earlier is all ah. yours. Wait, what? Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> all right. The first one, cactus and seal jack. Yes, cactus and seal. All right. So we all done the jumping jack before. Uh -huh. So with the cactus jack and seal jack, cactuses will look like this. Uh -huh. Reach from the sky, elbows into the back pocket. Uh -huh. And then okay. the seal jacks for going wide like this. So we might need a little bit of real estate. Right. What if you're low impact? And if you're low impact, well, you just step out to the side. All right. You know, and find a little music, okay? okay. okay. All right, find all right, your groove. All right, guys, let's go for it. Okay. In three. Two, reach for the sky. One, let's go. Big reach. Yeah. Elbows into the back pocket. Uh -huh. Come on now. All right. Oh, okay. Nice, you know? Okay. Boom. Right. Getting that heart rate up. To make Waking up fall, that huh? chest. Okay. Now we're going to go into our seal jacks. Arms straight out. Out to a T in three. Keep moving. Two. One, let's do it. Arms straight out. Okay. There it is. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh. Come on, baby. Come on, Shana. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, there you go, Al. Right. Love it. Love it. We're going to rock out here for another five, four, three, two. One. One. All right, catch your breath and reset. All right, okay. All right. Nice. Right. Nice. What's, what's, what's the breathing? good morning? The good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Interlock your hands behind your head. Okay. Then we're going to hinge at the hips like this. Back is parallel to the sky. We'll come up. Then we'll squeeze in a squat. Oh, we're going to alternate okay. between the two. We're going to go good morning. Good morning. And then right into a squat. Yes. Yes. That's your practice set. The time is about to start right now. Y'all ready or not? We're ready. Let's go in three. Hands behind the head. Uh -huh. Two. One. Let's go. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Stand up. Go into that squat. Oh, Ooh, do it again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Oh, to that squat. Now pull your elbows to the sky behind you. Keep it going. <laughs> okay. Love it. Ow, What's I see that Greg? rhythm, baby. Come on now. We are here for another five. <laughs> okay. Push those hips back. Four. Uh -huh. I said good morning. Give me good two. Morning. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> we got one more. Boom. When's it after? Right. When's it afternoon? <laughs> awesome job. So far, so good. Now okay. we're going to talk to our core. Okay. okay. Hello, so core. On the floor. Yeah. Okay. All we have to do is opposite elbow to opposite knee. Hands back here. We're going just like this. Marching in place. Okay. 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 Let me see it in five, four, three. Standing, this is standing oblique. oblique. Standing crunch. oblique crunch. Let's go. Right, let's Boom. Go. Opposite knee to opposite elbow. Uh -huh. Well done. How long? We got Christmas in two weeks. We're going to go for at least about 30 to 40 seconds. So if we were to do this at home, would it still be about 30, 40 seconds? Absolutely. And make sure you get that Time is between. different here. You want about 20 more <laughs> seconds. <laughs> we're going to rock out for five. <laughs> it's a well, fine four, day. You might say, three, oh, you do it for six two. minutes or something. Oh. Janelle, you owe me the whole three thing seconds. Is oh, Everybody take a break. Sorry. Janelle owes me three. Okay. Two. Let's one. go. Let's Thank go. you. Right, yeah, quick, quick, to talk. Feet. quick feet, real quick. So we're going to bend our knees to 90 degrees. As fast as you can. You're going to move your feet. All right? Wait. Wait for the car. Oh, 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 all right. Three, two, one. Quick for you. Let's go. Move it. Move it. Oh, oh, oh. Come on, Al. Oh, get him. Oh, get him. Oh, oh, get him. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, come on. Oh, yeah, you see oh, the heels. Let's go. Come on. Oh, oh, four, four, three, 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 two, one. Oh, oh, let's go. Let's go. Good job. Good job, baby. Oh, man. All right. All right. Thank you so much. We got four moves. Thank you. Four, four minutes. Four for four. four. All right. I see a little, Ooh, little sweat. Top, I'm like glistening. It. I'm glowing. Oh, stop, Don't forget to have the QR code to sign right, up for exactly. that Start Today newsletter. <laughs> Don't miss a new episode of our Start Today show on streaming today oh, all day. Good. This morning, 10 a.m. today.com. Flash all day. Boom. Stream on Peacock. Boom. All right. Quick feet. Quick feet. Hey. 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 Like that. Woo. Get him.
sweat feet. <laughs> We're legit sweaty. That's right. Tomorrow on the third hour of today, actor Dermot Mulroney live talking about his new rom-com. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna Emmy, Tony and Grammy winner, Billy Porter. We will see you back here with a quick feet tomorrow. Have a great Monday. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names only on today. See, we're coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stuff with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about. Only on today. Today, Grammy, Emmy, and Tony-winning star Billy Porter is here. Plus, three of our viewers go head-to-head -head in a Christmas dessert challenge. And tennis superstar Serena Williams revealing a very surprising skincare secret. And we're talking about it. From Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, it's today with Hoda and Jenna. It all starts right now. Good morning, good morning. It is Monday, the 11th day of December. We're getting close. Two weeks, two weeks exactly. We are today. getting close. It's I feel Christmas. like this weekend was like holiday party extravaganza. Yeah. Do you feel that way? Yes. I felt like there was lots of getting ready for the holidays and having drinks with friends and all kinds of I know. Of I feel I'm sort of ready to go to the sober living house where my I parents mean. live. <laughs> Because sometimes, because, well, sometimes you you don't realize how many days in a row you're going no, out. With you're something. doing things. I mean, to have plans Thursday, Friday, and Saturday is too much. That's too much. And we both did that. We both did that. Okay, so we did have our Today Show crew got together for drinks. Now this is how we party, which is how wish. How I'd party. like to party. 3 p.m. We meet, and for most people. Most, it was a wrap by 5 or 5.30. That's two hours of sitting there and talking and drinking. For others, I heard you were the ringleader. That's where... I was not the ringleader. I, uh, this I heard not, from sources that they said... That is not let's true. Let's get the check. It was, it was late. That is not and, true. And if somebody, anything, I left somebody, before. Sources say that you said, one more round, and then That's everybody... Not True, and in fact, I'm going to talk to that source okay. in a minute because I left first. There you was did? four of us standing. I won't mention any names. Savannah, I, Chanel, Dylan, and you. That's correct. Right. And then... Sounds like other people are narking out. <laughs> first of all, <laughs> when's the last time anyone said that word? Oh, Henry okay. loves to say it to my okay, kids. Okay, so then you left. and then I the left, and then the others followed to the point where they said, where'd you go? And I said, I did what Hoda does best. I needed to get home because I had to go to Maine the next morning. Oh, okay. Okay? And you did, so you went to Maine the next morning. I went to Maine, which Oh I, my gosh. I want you to come wait what's, one year. Wait, what's going on here? This that is, is all of us. <laughs> so who's all of us? That's my children, yeah. that's my cousin, yeah. my two cousins, their children. Who's the Grinch? Who's that's the That's my the cousin, back? Walker. Oh my god, Walker. And we didn't know it was him at first. There he is. My gosh, he, that's he an incredible was the star. Costume. People were coming up, but what's happening there is the whole town. Is that Wendy? Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's Walker's Wendy's brother. Yes, the whole town is. Oh. That's my husband. Oh. The whole town is decorated, 
and the tree lights and you all count down. You're caroling. You're singing I songs. I love this. And, and unfortunately, they made us start counting from 43 <laughs> because it had been 43 years. And I was like, 43? 42. But we had the best time. It was. Do you guys always dress up like that? Well, this is only the second year we've oh, gone. Oh, okay. But we had book signings, mm -hmm. um, which was so much fun. My sissy was there. We went for winter beach walks. You did? Which was Really fun. I, you probably do that all the I love all a winter beach walk. I love that. But the, it's up. to be really in the magic. So much like the caroling, the tree lighting. They, there's fireworks. My gosh, it's, this town it's is so awesome. Cute. It's like walking into a Hallmark movie. Oh, I'm so glad. Um, but and you had and I and I would have been at this wedding, and I'm sad to have missed it. You had a wedding Saturday night. J.K. Long, one of our favorite producers, and uh, Reed, her now husband. That was us at the wedding. There's I, J.K. I right look, there. Look, J.K.'s in the middle. You that took was, a lot of selfies. I took some drunky selfies. Okay, everybody does. Um, <laughs> it was beautiful. It was nice. J.K. By the way, can bring everybody together. That's the magic of her. Yeah. All people from all the eras yes. who've worked with her were all there. Was and that fun to see beautiful. all of our yeah. friends? Yeah. yeah, I think it was a. It's a beautiful gathering when everyone's together and everyone was celebrating her. Yeah, and I was thinking, J.K. is the person who could bring everyone together. Totally, always. And, and it was J.K. has celebrated so many of us yes. so many times. She, if you, if someone does a beautiful piece on a milestone for someone. Chances JK's are JK it. has produced it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for her, it was her moment. She had a yacht rock band that was playing all that Christopher Cross. They all had yacht hats I on. I saw the yacht hats. It didn't was get it. the Fun. best. Everyone was on the dance floor. Did you no, dance? I danced. I danced with everybody. I danced with Roker. I danced with Savannah. I just danced around. Okay, I'm glad. I'd like to hear that. Yes, I did. Okay, well, it was a wonderful well, okay. time. Hey, it was had by, had by all. all. And I am going to get back at those people that blamed it on me because I don't appreciate it. By the way, we were still home by 7 o'clock. Are you going back to the drinks yeah, for the I am. Today Show? Because I don't like to be go. narked on. No. <laughs> okay, Serena Williams, y'all, is making headlines uh -huh. for a shocking new skincare find. So she had a sunburn, mm -hmm. and she posted this video about how she was going to try and make it better. Take a look. I'm trying some breast milk. Um, it works for my kid. Like they say, put breast milk on everything, and I have a lot extra. So I'm going to try it for like a week or so, a week or so under my eye, and see how it goes. So what happened? After we, a week or so. We, so she said after a week or so of using her breast milk. Yeah, what happened? Her skin felt better. Hmm. Well, according to verywellfamily.com, some people do use breast milk to treat minor cuts and wounds, <laughs> eye and ear infections, sore throats. There's no medical proof. Wait, but eye and ear infections? You drop a little drop in your eyeball? I don't know. And in your ear, maybe you drop it in. I don't, we don't, and by the way, we don't We recommend. don't know because we, we know. have never done this and we're not doctors. No. Or nurses. No, neither. Or pharmacists. I think a good thing to have, lately at night, I've been having this ginger tea, which is real ginger yes. ground up. Yes. Do you know what I'm talking I sure about? Do, girl. <laughs> it's so, it's potent. Potent. It makes potent. your, wait, it makes your, your throat burn like it's You're, on fire. Eyes watering. Yes. Do we know the queen of who We makes know it? who that we queen both, is. We both share this very good friend of yes. ours who makes this delicious, delicious tea. And it does make you feel better. Is that your home remedy? That's one of my home remedies. The you know what you've taught me? What? Is to eat spoonfuls of, and you and Laura. Raw, raw honey. honey. When my throat was feeling kind of itchy. You know why? Raw honey is a natural antibiotic. Yes. And you take it. And you think, I think of this often, like penicillin was invented in the 40s right. sometime. So before 1940s, people were not all dying from infection. There were other ways people got better. Yes. Step from the earth. Natural. Things. Yeah. So I think it's when people have these ideas, I think we're really quick to say, let me get a, get a quick medicine and get yeah. that over with. But I think sometimes there's some natural things. And I why like not? That. Um, okay, you guys, a new, new NBC's article, Ask a Question. Hmm. It's a really important one. What is it? Is clubbing dead? Oh. So apparently many, G -Z many Gen Zers are taking to TikTok to say clubbing isn't what it was made out to be. They were disappointed. They say when, when they, they were clubbing. younger, pop music was all about the club, you know, which it was, remember? The Jersey Shore. Yeah. 50 Cent, <laughs> meet you in the club, you know? Yeah. Okay, so now 
they say the clubbing let is them not down. it let them down. They don't like the Their vibe. Their expectations were they too high. Maybe they don't like being around a ton of people they don't know. <laughs> no, because you have to have conversations. But you don't have to talk to them. Can't you just go with a little posse of girls and not talk to everybody? I think there's something fun about clubbing because you go in and you know why you're going. Like, we're going to dance, we're yes. going to let loose. Everybody who's going has the exact same idea. Well, I think what makes it fun, what? you said the word, what? is to dance. Dance. We don't get to dance that dance. much. So uh, here's the thing. I think if, if your expectation is that clubbing is supposed to be done every weekend, no, 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 no. It's like anything special doesn't work if you do it every week. It's then it's not special. It's supposed to be a rare occasion. Yes, an exciting Where fun. you let yes. your hair down. Let's go crazy. But I will tell you what, what? the problem is for you and me. What? Clubs don't get Open. going until 9 p.m. Do you remember what Jamie Lee Curtis said? Yeah. There should be clubbing midday. It should be. That's what she said. There should People be. People like to dance anytime. If you only can dance in the dark after you've had 10 drinks. Yeah, then that's, that's not, a problem. No, there, you, you, dancing is just fun. I know. Even. Well, should we make a daytime disco? <gasps> I think you just said Talia just said wait, something. I'm wait, so wait, wait. scared. No, we're no, this is good. When wait, we throw wait, out wait, ideas. Wait, wait. That's a great idea, Jenna. A daytime Jenna. disco. We're gonna do a daytime disco. Oh, Allie is Allie Love in? is on board. Allie's Allie in. Love, who is standing by because we're gonna be doing our Tuesday Tuesday. What do you think, Allie? I'm daytime in. clubbing? I'm in. I'm in. Okay, she's in. in. Okay, well, our very stylish friend, she's picked up some outfits for us. We're gonna reveal them and choose the look right after this. Daytime. It's that time when our viewers get to weigh in on our style in a segment we call Choose the Look. And today, contributor Allie Love put together some outfits for all for us. And you guys at home get to vote on what we should wear. Allie, what did you pick? Hi, Allie. Oh, hi, ladies. I am so thrilled to be here. I love fashion. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you favorite. have such a signature you look, do. which is color. I know. So I mean, why not dare to be bold? Let's. I mean, get into the socks. I love a good sock queen. It's a great way not to have to get a pedicure in the winter when you have open toe shoes. So right? cute. All yeah. right, talk us through them. Okay, so three looks. Here's the deal. I, we're gonna start with Hoda's look. I love a statement piece. Mm -hmm. Most of us have cable sweaters or big chunky sweaters for the winter. It's cold outside, it's cozy, but you wanna be cozy and cool. So with that, we've done something with a pattern here. We styled it with a bold pant. And then why not wear sneakers once in a while to the office? So this is look one. Once again, you have your statement piece, mm -hmm. you have your pant, and you have your shoe. Okay. Moving right along, monochromatic. Ooh. I love all one color. As you can see, love you can that. colorful, or you can have all one color. Cable sweater, green's in. Hoda has on green. I have Jenna and Hoda, I'm like the perfect match of you all. Oh, yeah, so you are. Seriously. Like, I got the memo today. <laughs> But monochromatic cable sweater, a nice flowy That's skirt. That's chic. And heels. Yes, we're looking chic. We're looking available and ready for work. Ooh, I like need. that too, though. And then last Pretty. but not least, most importantly, our power suit. We're going to change up the flare. Instead of a bold color, though, we're giving a bold pattern on this one with a pop of color underneath. And then I threw in the socks. I don't know if you can get into it. Yellow socks to match on this look, Hoda. Go, but girl. Again, so, friends, when you're thinking of choosing the look, we want them to step out to be comfortable, but more importantly, to feel good and look good and then feel good about the way they look. Right? All right, let's see Jenna's, I can't wait. All right, Jenna. Yes, ma'am. Hopping on over, same idea here. A cable sweater, but be bold at the top. We put, tie it in with the pant and sneaker at the bottom. Just I like it. Be twinsies, because I love a good matching moment. 
And then I see you rocking this, which is what you have on right now. Yeah. Which is more of like a knit, like a knit moment. Yeah, you so look this good is in a two-piece knit moment with a pocket. Who doesn't love a pocket? Mm -hmm. Looks you know comfortable I mean? too. It's very comfortable. It's cozy. It's chic, monochromatic once again. And then we have a statement shoe with a thigh-high boot. Well, right let's there. see those boots. Ooh. Green. Green and blue. Pop of color just to show that you're available. You're ready. You're stylish. Power suit, bold color. Mm. I mean, this one is a, this has like a texture. I love texture. Texture on anything is more important than anything, right? The raw material, and you tie it again with a pop of comfortable shoes, but it's more about the suit. So you have your statement piece at the top for your first look. You have your monochromatic for your second look. And then She's final look is that power suit to tie it all in. I want people to choose something that maybe you two wouldn't wear all the time. Oh, okay. That's, that's your challenge. challenge. That's a challenge, Ali. You Allie, are the best. You're adorable. And you, Allie, you know what's awesome is that you know your style is so you. Like yeah. you're such a vibrant personality, and therefore you dress like that. We need to figure out yeah. what we're doing. What ours is. What are we doing? Great. Stop it. Oh, okay. Thank, thank you, Allie. Allie. And y'all do not forget. We need you. Go to our Instagram page and vote for your favorite look. All right. Speaking of looks, one of Hollywood's most fashionable stars is here. The one, the only, Billy Porter. Right after this. Coming up tomorrow, Glenn Powell and Sydney Sweeney dish on their new rom-com. Plus a performance by pop sensation Tate McRae. And HGTV's Egypt Sherrod and Mike Jackson. It's all Tuesday on Hoda and Jenna. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, we're coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. The miracle. The miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. Wait, what, what, what? Pump it up. This is called Baby Was a Dancer by this talented actor and singer right here, Billy Porter, and the song is off his new album. It's called Black Mona Lisa. Billy is an Emmy, Grammy, and two-time Tony winner who's also a new movie out called Our Son about a couple going through a divorce and fighting over custody. Billy, you're having a moment. Yes. I guess I am. You are a moment. Yes, yes, I am. And I am sorry, but that music, we need to go out day it's clubbing. Like, day it, clubbing we, too. we talked about day clubbing. That there should be not just nightclubs, but there, day clubs. Right? There should be day clubs. Okay. In the gay community, we call it a uh, uh, daytime party. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Um, okay, so talk to us about this album. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this album is has been 30 years in the making. Mm. Um, my first mainstream R&B album came out in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And the industry was very homophobic at the time. Yeah. Like, you know, sometimes violently so, mm -hmm. and it didn't work out for me, but I'm multi-hyphenated, I kept mm -hmm. going, and now it has come around. Mm -hmm. And I've had this real second chance 
on my fifth album to go mainstream. Mm -hmm. And it's just been magical. You know, everything on the album, I'm, ca I'm calling it my magnum opus. Mm -hmm. up this point. <laughs> you know, who knows what's to come. But, you know, everything comes from me. I wrote every song but one of them. Mm -hmm. It's a celebration of life and love and joy and hope and peace. And, you know, I hope it's healing. It's everything people. we need right I now. I hope it's healing when you when you listen to it. Well, it's you got your mama on your necklace. And yes, she was actually, she actually watched you perform. She did. What did that feel like having her in uh, the audience? Well, you know, what was so great about it is, you know, I come from a very religious background. My mother is very mm. religious. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, the religious community really ostracized her mm -hmm. when her son wouldn't go back into the closet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was talk from the pulpits, curses. You know, I would never be blessed. Mm. And I'm so grateful that she's been able to live long enough to see me mm. Mm. have this kind of success to prove that that rhetoric no longer has any credibility. I'm so grateful that she's been able I mean, to live. You, she and stood, it's a redemption. Yeah, she stood by she you. She stood by when me. When others said. Yes. What, and what did that, how do you feel like that changed everything for you to have somebody unconditionally love you? Well, I think it's what we talk about all the time. You know, when when we have support from our family. Yeah. Um, it's much easier to navigate life. Mm -hmm. You know, very often queer people are kicked out of their spaces. And we have figured out how to create our chosen families, mm -hmm. you know, and so that's okay too. Yeah. You know, family comes in many different mm -hmm. forms. Yeah. I like that you're touring and it's the first time you've been touring as yourself, not as a character. Yes. But that brings with it, you're really gonna like me as me, or, you or know, not, or not. But and that's, that's okay. A, that's a very vulnerable place sure to be. Yes. How have you been? How has it been? It has been so great to go back out on the road, to go on the road, really for my first time. Yeah. With my music, like with a rock and roll tour bus. Oh my God! And Look everything at you. I did at the Black Mona Lisa tour, Volume One, back in May. It was like 25 cities in five weeks. I got on that bus. I was so scared because I was like, I'd never done it before. Yeah. Yeah. You know. It was a blast. I can't <laughs> wait to get back. The band, the crew, you know, it's just so joyful. And I had the best sleep of my life. How do you keep your voice from getting hoarse from all that singing? I've been doing what's, eight what's, shows a week. But what's your, you have a I've been doing eight shows oh, a week yeah. for, for 30 years. years yeah. So oh, bro, it's in my, voice, it's, 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 in it's a muscle. It's in my DNA. Uh -huh. um, you know what I love that you just said is that yeah. you, there was, you were a little scared because it was the yeah. first time doing yeah. something. Yeah. And you've done a lot. I mean, I won know. a million awards. <laughs> I know. Uh, and yet, you can it's still, still a first find... Time. I love it. Isn't that so It is so magical yeah. to, after all of the things and all of the experiences I've had, to be able to still experience something new. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's great. We never stop growing. Mm -hmm. We never stop. You know what I love about you? You you worked so hard, but it took until, I think, 50 to win your first Emmy. Yes. You won a lot of your accolades came later yes. in life. Yes. And therefore, I would imagine a ton more meaningful. Yeah. Talk about that. You know, I just, I had the opportunity to live and grow up and watch and observe how this industry can eat you up and spit you out. Mm. And so when it happens really young for people, it's really, I've watched it be yeah. very hard to navigate. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm 54 mm -hmm. and it's still, you know, some yeah. of the stuff that happens is still like, <laughs> yeah. You know, but because I'm grounded and yeah. because I know who I am and because I lead with my authenticity and my truth, it has been a much much better journey. Mm. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. we have to talk about our son. Yes. This movie is yes. beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank talk you. about what drew you to it. Well, it's a divorced child custody drama yeah. in the mm. spirit of like Kramer versus Kramer yes. mm. or marriage story. And you know, I fought. My generation fought for marriage equality. Yeah. And with marriage equality, the right to marry comes the right to divorce. Mm. And we have to tell all of the stories. Yeah. It's also a really quiet character it's a quiet story yeah. and i'm known for my flamboyance i'm known for being loud mm -hmm. and yeah boisterous for your fashion and, and, yeah. my, and everything and so it was wonderful to sort of be able to bring it back and be quiet and show a different side let's of show, my, let's myself show a, clip, a little clip of that. please please okay. look at me i was with owen when he was an idea when he was a seedling when he was born, 
every day, every step of the way, I, I, I attended to him. Whoa. Wow. That's a beautiful scene. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's a beautiful movie. And it's about, you know, it's about how people come into your life for a reason, a season, and or a lifetime. Mm. And the good news is that couple makes it to lifetime. It's different in the configuration. Mm -hmm. of It's different than how it started out. And it's a yes and. Mm. Ooh, and it's like powerful. It. And so I was able to write a song for the show that Luke and I sang together. Um, called Always Be My Man. And, you know, it's a queer duet by two queer out above the title, you know, leading <laughs> men in Hollywood. Yes. Yeah. It's a first of something. Yeah. And um, I'm excited for the world to see that and hear that song, too. Mm. <laughs> it's really beautiful. Thank you. We know you're kind of going through a transitional time in your life. Too. Yes. Where do you get your strength? Where do you gather? Um... You know, my mom is my hero. <laughs> you know, I believe in higher powers, uh, a higher power. I believe in um, uh, meditation. Mm. Everything is as it should be. And um, moving forward with loving kindness, mm. grace, and compassion mm. in all things. Boy, that's that's the secret right there. I want to yes. write that down. Billy, Beautiful. thank you so much. Thank Billy's you. album, Black Mona Lisa, out now. His movie, Our Son, is in select theaters and will be on video on demand starting on Friday. Thank you. Really thank incredible, you. Congrats. Billy. We adore you. Thank you. Coming up next, three of our viewers go head to head in our Christmas dessert challenge. Okay. Right after this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're calling Hoda and Jenna's Christmas Dessert Challenge. Challenge. Okay, we got three great viewers. Peyton is here, Marilyn is here, and Jackie. And they each brought us their family's delicious desserts for us to try. We have a veteran here. We do. Veteran Today Show judge to choose the winner, Henry Johnson, yeah. son of our producer, Sarah. So this is not your first rodeo. Mm -hmm. Remember that other one? Do you love, <laughs> um, do you love judging Holiday dessert competitions? Yes, I do. I okay. think it could be his profession. <laughs> I think so, too. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, um, shall we start? Yes. Can you please Peyton. tell us, Peyton, what this is about? You're from New York City. Yes. Well, I'm from Nashville. I live in New York okay. City now. Okay. But okay. So, I have for y'all today a holiday brownie trifle. <gasps> I got this recipe from a dear neighbor and family friend. Mm -hmm. And I grew up eating it around the holidays and every big gathering. What's going on in here? This specific yeah. version, it's going to be homemade gooey brownies, chocolate pudding, Whoa. cheese bar pieces, and a eggnog flavored whipped oh, cream. Thank you. Wow. Can I scoop you out some? Absolutely. Oh. And the best part about this dish is you can mix and match like to fit your yeah, own flavor preferences. Yeah. 
yes. and each holiday season. Oh but God. this one is definitely delectable. Is this your favorite one? This is my favorite one. I'm a chocolate Okay, lover, hold on. So you got this my go to. Okay. Yeah. Is yours? Yes. Wow. Okay, hold on. Give uh, it a go. Okay. You are so polite. Thank you. Did your Sarah, mom, Sarah Claggett, Sarah you really know what? raised you right. Okay, here okay, we go. Okay, ready? Uh huh. Henry, remember, you have to do your work. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Mm hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think about it. That's good. All right, Henry gives it a that's good, but we're going to compare. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Peter. So you Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we have Marilyn. All right, Marilyn. Where are you from, Marilyn? New Jersey. New Jersey. And you're a loving nurse. Retired nurse. Retired nurse and mother. Now, tell us about your recipe. Well, I've been going to this same hairdresser for 36 years. Okay. And every year, I face the problem of Christmas presents. Okay. And how many bottles of wine can yeah. I drink? Yeah. Exactly. So I had this epiphany okay. that I was going to make pie or cake because I'm known for for that, for that. For my family. Okay. Yes. So, this here is your you apple have, pie. This is my apple pie. And your family work, says this is delicious. I delicious. Think. So, I make, and it's good a la mode, right? It is. Oops, sorry, yeah, Henry. I think you need to you put ice cream on it, Henry. Okay. Yes. Okay, try and bite. I add myself some. Okay. Yeah, this is a big slice. That's a, it big, is a big slice. slice. You make a good slice. Here. I always love apple pie at Thanksgiving. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Well, I hope you like it. Mmm. Mmm. Marilyn, mm. very yummy. Oh, my gosh. Mmm. I love the little sugar on top. Mm -hmm. It's so yummy. The crust is it's so homemade. Oh, those apples are homemade. You, know, you can tell. Mm -hmm. Everything is homemade. Mm -hmm. Lots Still of warm apples. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Warm and cold. Serve it warm or cold. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marilyn. You're welcome. All right. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Hello. Okay, please tell us about what we have here. Well, this is Jackie's special rum cake. Rum cake. Rum cake. Okay. Yes. Start with me. Just have a I have a couple of different uh, pound cake recipes. Yeah. I have an aunt that's 99 years old. Oh. And back years ago, she said to me, well, you need to spice it up some. Why don't you put some rum in it? So I was like, okay. Now, what about Henry? Is he okay drinking, yeah. eating this? It's okay. It's been, it's, okay. It's, it's been burnt off because it's all about the rum. It's the butter and the sugar that's inside. Okay, yummy. Oh, my gosh. I can it already tell. So I want to just dense. Mm. 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 That's really good. Wait, <laughs> what's going on in there? Uh, rum. Mm. <laughs> but it doesn't taste too alcoholic. It doesn't. No, 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 it doesn't. It oh doesn't. But God. I'll tell you, no matter how much rum I put in it, it's never enough for the guys in my family. Mm -hmm. They're always like, you gotta put more, you gotta By put way, more. But it's, it's so, so moist. moist. I've never tried, well, how is it so moist, the rum? Maybe. Buttermilk. Buttermilk. Ooh, so good. Rum. What do you right. think, Henry? Okay. Okay. I really like it. Oh, okay. Especially now. since I've never had rum before. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I'm glad you've never had rum before. Flag it. Good on you. Yeah. All right. So now we have to sort of pow awesome. What do you think? Hello. 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 Okay. Hello. Okay. okay, we have to couple. Kill our mics, please. Okay. <laughs> Challenge, right? And it was really hard. We yeah. should point out every all single three. person had a vote. All of them were amazing. Well, I think the winner oh. is the wrong <laughs> game. Congratulations. By the way, everyone oh, had a vote. It was thank all you. Henry all yeah, the Henry way. made the, the final <laughs> yeah. thing, and who would have known? And the winner, you get a uh, Hoda and Jenna mm -hmm. cake stamp. Oh, I yeah. love it. Oh, wow. But nobody's going home empty. <laughs> yeah, you guys got your swag bags. Y'all, your desserts guys. are to die for. Oh, so three delicious. Of them are wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and wow. thank you. Thank all right. For more on these desserts, and you, I know you all want all the recipes, go to hodaandjenna.com. Coming up next, from sweet treats to barbecue, delicious mail order food. Yes. Merry Christmas from Hoda and Jenna with la, 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 Right after this. La, la, la. <laughs> wow, you guys. Oh, these are so high to buy.
just 14 days until Christmas, two weeks, and if you still can't figure out what to get some friends and family members, you can't go wrong with food. Yeah, Danielle Cartis is the author of Butter, Flour, Sugar, Joy. Love it. She brought us some of her favorite mail order food gifts. Yes, and we still did. time, still time still to get time. these out. Okay. I'm not done Christmas shopping. Are you guys done? No, no. no. Okay. And I no. haven't started. I haven't started. I have a little checklist that I have in my notes, and I'm like, I have literally got so much to buy. But these are some lovely gifts. Yes. Okay, let's start with these incredibly beautiful cookies. These literally feel like little paintings. So this Works is from Mackenzie art. Limited. I'm mm -hmm. here trying to grab them. But yeah, look how cute. Bit. They're 1900s postcards. Oh my gosh. Look at how beautiful. And they taste good. Because you really, sometimes when you're buying something, you're buying it for looks. Yeah. And these actually taste really good. So they're so pretty. And I like to give a little cookie, uh, free shipping for the Today Show, Ooh. which is great. So today, 23 for the shipping. Mm -hmm. um, I like to give these with a gift card to a teacher. Yeah. I think it's so cute. Oh, you can break it up. Idea. You can break it up. So if you're buying like the box, of art. yes, yeah. you can give them to all the teachers. Yes, give them all the teachers. Okay. That's a great one. Let's this one's chocolates. super cute. Chocolates. Okay, look at these little reindeers. Let's stop it. This is the cordial cherry, a woman-owned business, which is fun out of Omaha, awesome. which we love. And then they're all hand painted. They make them they're all. Beautiful. And look at the little bird. My kids freaked out for these ones. Oh, they're, they're so, so cute. cute. I was a teacher. Cherries and truffles. And I feel like this would be a great. This gift. is a good one too. I wanted unique things like. Oh, that feels a little different. Yeah. And Sarah, our producer, she's the one who told me about these. They enjoyed them on Thanksgiving break. Ah. They were so tasty. Ah. Yummy. So my kids freaked out for these guys. All right. Now, this is controversial. This? Yes. Is it? It's a surprise. It is. It's, it's a surprise. It's caramel popcorn with Old Bay seasoning. Definitely different. So it's like a play on the cheddar caramel, I think. Okay. But people send popcorn. So yes. if you love Old Bay. If you and love you Old love Bay caramel. and you love caramel. Or if you like salty sweet. Okay. If you like salty sweet, I'll try it. I'll Go try for it. it. I'm not going to try it because then it'll be, I'll be chewing it for the whole rest of the okay. segment. And then if you love go. Old Bay, if you love Old Bay, That's are you an Old thing. Bay lover? You know, yeah, <laughs> we'll move, moving right along. We love it. Buy the popcorn. By the, way, by the way, good. Tasty. But good. Okay. I love that. But a surprise. <laughs> but a surprise. You're so yeah. cute. Okay. So this one, this What's is this? so cute. So these are from Harry and David. Look at I their, love Harry the and David and everything. Yes. Wait, what? You guys did the bordery What's for bordery? Jenna's bookshop. It's a cheese. A cheese company. Oh. Like, remember? Do we're cheese boarding? Yes. Oh. Cheese boarding. And then look, you can taste this one. There's multiple different so wait, flavors. So like what these are you ginger. These? Are you cooking them? You What's cook going them. On? They come frozen. Okay. And, and they're then you cook them brie. in a cute little... Uh, a little dish, and then they're stuffed with brie and then like all kinds of flavors. So there's ginger, there's a chocolate raspberry. By the way, what a cute gift. Yeah, isn't this fun? Can I see it and when it came, I thought how stinking it. cute in the little wood tray. Then you could put crackers and everything. Well, in also, it. then you can yeah. also, you Some know. Some dried tomatoes mm. and yummy pastry. Oh my gosh. So good, so good. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. And then we're moving on to Girl Meets Dirt. This is from the Pacific Northwest. So this has little. This little guy has my heart because mm -hmm. I live in Washington State. Mm -hmm. These are from Orcas Island. The most beautiful, wonderful women make it. Mm -hmm. Up in like this magical, almost fairy like beautiful orchard. Don't okay. they get that. fruit from everywhere. The hot damn pepper jam is my favorite. Ooh, like to hot die hot damn for. Pepper jam. Yes. You can put that on meat, right? Yes. Meat. It's so good on salmon. <laughs> it's good on pork chops, but it's really good slathered on cheese People and brie. Put jalapeno jelly on meats. Yes. I mean, you, this is how you said it. I'm going to make that for you. Mm. We're going to make something with some jelly on it. Isn't that good? That tastes like your hot honey. See why so you good. Want, I meat. love that. See why you'd want to do You could smear on pizza too. <laughs> And what are the other flavors? Sorry. Okay. So there's a vanilla. Let's see here. Mm. I'm like, turn them around. Mm, this good. one that you're tasting is the vanilla plum. Oh. All the plum stuff is so good. And then the salted caramel apple. Yummy. So, so good. Salted caramel yes, apple. Yes. And free shipping today, Girl, you guys. I bet you could put this on some ice cream. All right. Yes, wait, speaking so of meat, which actually we could do a meat. little experiment if you'd Joe's like to. Joe's Barbecue. If you want to put the hot pepper jam on the meat. I double like it. This is from Joe's? <laughs> yes. This is from I Joe's in Kansas ribs. City. This is a Kelsey mm. family favorite, too. So. Don't you know, if, if Travis Kelsey likes it, Wait, probably Taylor Swift does honestly, too. Honestly, Merry Christmas. I got you some ribs. <laughs> no, I, I love ribs. Ribs this are my favorite. This is good for, like, she likes to eat for guys. Ribs. She likes to eat them on, the, on her um, floor. Yeah. Oh, ribs are my favorite. They are. Okay, so talk to me. What about these? Okay, so these guys, you're going to get a free pound mm. of burn ends if you order, I think, through the, through the end of the week, which is actually kind of fun. But this is in Kansas City, Kansas City Barbecue. You get some barbecue sauce, and it just sort of um, mixes it up. Instead of giving candy and stuff, give somebody some delicious barbecue. Give some meat. Great idea. Give some meat. Meet the gift, the gift that keeps on giving. You're so cute. You're thank awesome. You, thank, thank you. you. To check out these products, head today.com slash gifts. Coming up next, a big surprise may be in store when we play Suddenly Santa with some friends after the plaza.
It's the holidays and snow is falling, so let's go snowballing. Hey, enough of this stalling. It's suddenly Santa. Oh, oh, oh. oh, it is time for Suddenly Santa. We make one Plaza Fans Day a little bit brighter, and here to play is Jared Sheckle from DeWitt, Iowa. He's here with his wife, Beth, who's right over there. It's their 15th anniversary, but y'all, they've known each other since kindergarten, I mean, so it's a long romance. Do you not love that? And you guys, your flight was canceled? Was I'm canceled, so happy. Yeah. So you, you could have just stayed in the hotel room, but instead you're coming to play Suddenly Santa yes. with us. All right, here how it works. Okay, you're going to have a bucket of snowballs yeah. uh -huh. that are right over there. Uh -huh. You have 30 seconds to toss as many of those snowballs into these red buckets, and you will get the corresponding prize. So if you get one in the bucket, you'll get this prize, two, three, on and on. Any and bucket. each prize, yeah, and it could be any bucket, right. and each prize gets a little better and better. Okay. Okay. So why don't, you, Jared, why don't you stand yeah. on that candy cane, Lane, and then when okay. I pull this big candy cane, then you can start. And okay. just have fun, because okay. you know what? You've got it. Let's We're not go worried about fun. it. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Let's go. There you go. One. There you go. So one, two, three. Uh, th oh, you got it. Three, four, five, six. Oh my gosh. Okay, I was so fast. He said By the he way, went, you know what? He said he wanted his nerves out. I'm glad you had. Look at that. You got him out. You got it. And you had plenty of time. That was what 12. we called a record breaker. Okay. okay. You didn't get right. one. You didn't get two. You didn't get three, four, five. You got number six. What's oh. number six? Jared, let's find out what is in number six. <laughs> it's a beach ball. What? A beach ball? That means one thing. I think you're going on a trip. Announcer, <laughs> tell us where he's headed. You're going to the Dominican Republic. Thanks to Apple Vacations, you'll enjoy a five-day, four-night trip for two to the all-inclusive Malia Caribe Beach Resort in Punta Cana. Experience beautiful beaches, dance classes, water sports, golfing, and 13 restaurants. Round-trip airfare included. Have a great trip. You're going to Punta Cana. Are you glad that you're your trip with kids? Yes, very much so. Nice to tell your three kids that mom and dad are taking another trip. Yes. Wow. I'm so happy for you. Thank you so much. And happy 15th wedding anniversary. That's our wedding That could be our anniversary trip to you. That's amazing. Thank you guys. Wait, what are your kids' names? June, Josie, and Brig. June, Josie, and Brig. We love you. We'll be back right after this. Oh, my God. These guys have been out in the rain all day today. We're so happy you came to New York City to see us. Coming up tomorrow, Glenn Powell and Sydney Sweeney will bring us a holiday rom-com. Watch HGTV's Egypt Sherrod and Mike Jackson help you revamp your living spaces. And we got a pop performance by Tate McRae. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Back. Here we go. Boom. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. Happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all.
Ah, pizza. The golden crust, the tangy sauce, and that ooey gooey cheese. It's no surprise that this divine creation is one of America's most popular foods. But in the countless pizzerias I've been to, it's still pretty rare to see a woman tossing dough or tending a giant oven. I'm Elena Besser. I'm a professional chef, recipe developer, and content creator, so I'm constantly curious about who is making my meals. Now I'm heading out to meet the women breaking barriers in the pizza world today and creating more space for everyone at the table. Mankind has been eating flatbreads for centuries, but the modern pizza was invented in Naples, Italy. It was popular among the working class who needed meals that were quick and cheap. When Queen Margarita of Savoy visited Naples in the late 1800s, Chef Rafael Esposito served her a pie inspired by Italy's national colors. The Queen's approval turned this humble street food into a royal favorite. So you could say it was a woman who really put pizza on the world map. I think the love from pizza is something I always say, uh, I think is my blood. Georgia Capruccio owns Manhattan's Don Antonio, known for its classic Neapolitan pies. While New York City has thousands of pizzerias, very few are actually owned by women. What do your guests say when they walk into the restaurant and they see a woman standing at the pizza oven making their pizza? So some of the people are, are really, I can see from the face, the surprise. Wow. And they bring the kids, they bring the daughter to see, to have, you know, pizza and it's super fun. Georgia is one of only two women to ever win one of Italy's largest pizza competitions, a feat she accomplished at just 21 years old. Her victory surprised everyone, including Georgia herself. It was crazy. My father signed for me. Wait, so he signed you up to compete in this competition and yeah. you had no idea? No idea, zero idea. Five minutes before the competition started, he came to me and said, oh, by the way, I signed up for you. Georgia placed first in the classic pizza category, cementing her love for the craft and giving her shop a major boost. I never, never imagined that I was, you know, I can win, I was super happy. That moment, it was unique because I remember it feel free, feel, feel super light. Growing up on a dairy farm in Terracina, Italy, Georgia's love for pizza started early. Tell me some of your earliest food memories. So my grandmother, for example, she was making pizza for me okay. every Sunday with just tomato sauce and oregano, so really simple. So I that's true grandma-style pizza from yeah. grandma herself. Georgia's grandmother may have introduced her to pizza, but it was her father, Roberto Capruccio, that made it a true family obsession. Roberto left his family and moved to Naples to study the art of pizza making. Georgia was just eight years old, so she rarely saw him growing up. By the early 2000s, Roberto's culinary chops brought him to the U.S. His restaurant, Keste, is touted as serving some of the best pizza in New York City. Did you ever think that you would end up in food one day? Never. Never. Also, when I first arrived over here, like I come in like New York for learn English mm -hmm. and never imagined. So the only option for me to, to know my father or to understand what he was doing is stay with him. This is why I started to make pizza. So Georgia moved to the States to reconnect with her father. Georgia was the only woman assembling pies in the kitchen, so she was motivated to prove she belonged. And also everybody, all the co-workers was make fun of me because Why? I was, because I don't know how to make pizza. I don't cook at home. So yeah. you're like, I'll show you. She shadowed her father for three years, but Roberto wanted his daughter to train harder. He sent her to Naples to study with his former mentor. She was the only female apprentice in her class. What were the responses from the other people that were learning alongside you, those men. So like they don't they don't feel that I can do like I can be successful or I can be or you know reach a high level of you know be a pizza maker because they say, oh one day you have kids so you stay home. Did you ever respond to them or did you just ignore them? I ignore my pizza is my business card. Georgia returned to the US with a renewed determination to make pizza her profession. She opened Don Antonio with her father in 2012. 
when did you have that spark where you realized, oh my goodness, this is what I'm gonna do for my career? When uh, I opened Don Antonio, so, okay. and uh, I was really in charge of everything in the kitchen. By that moment I say, I need to be the best. There's this term going around right now called Nepo baby, where it's the concept oh, yeah. of nepotism. But you have really taken time to learn the craft and do the work to prove yourself. So do you feel like you've been able to move outside of your dad's shadow? Not yet. Georgia says customers are still surprised that she's running the shop these days, not her famous father. You never saw a lot daughter follow, you know, pizza maker, uh, father pizza maker. After working 13 hour days for nearly a decade, she's had to take a step back with her first child on the way. Working in a kitchen, I can speak from experience, it is incredibly physically demanding. Yes. So how have you had to adapt as you've seen your body change? So I changed completely. <laughs> I need to change completely. Uh, so before I was really strong. Uh, I don't need to eat, I don't need to sleep a lot. Today, 10% of people working in the food and hospitality industries have access to some type of parental leave. Georgia is keenly aware she's in a unique position. I'm really lucky because I can organize myself in my job, mm -hmm. the other woman cannot. Right, you're, a, you're the boss, so you can call the shots and that actually works to your advantage. Yes. At Don Antonio, I was ready to see this boss get to work. Italy, just like the US, is home to many different regional styles of pizza. Georgia specializes in Neapolitan pizza, which is prized for its simplicity and high quality ingredients. The dough, the tomatoes, the types of cheese, and the techniques are all strictly regulated by two associations based in Naples. Georgia used to train chefs with the Associazione Pizzaioli Napoletani. So I was ready to learn from a true pizzaiola. What is the first step? So we start with the tomato. Neapolitan pizzas must be topped with tomatoes grown close to Naples. So basically I crush like that. Ooh, that must feel nice. Yes. The base of the dough uses water, fresh yeast, salt, and imported double zero flour, which refers to its super fine grind. This dough has been fermenting for a full day. So you can see the bubbling. Nice. So Neapolitan pizza, the characteristic is the bubble crust. The dough is cut and shaped into little balls, which rest for another five hours. For now this. we need to start to make the pizza. This is semolina. See the... Look at the bubbles. It's yes. alive. So now, what pizza maker, you avoid the pizza maker do is like just push the air. Okay. Oh wow, and you can see all of that air is pushing out to create that crust. Can I try? Yeah. It feels so fluffy. After the dough is stretched, it's time for the toppings. First up, the tomato sauce. So one exactly spoon. Now we put basil, pecorino. Okay, and that's a little saltier than traditional Parmesan. The pizza is finished with a hefty handful of mozzarella and a generous drizzle of fruity extra virgin olive oil. Then it's ready for the oven. And that's it. I love it. Ready to go. To the oven. The key to a stellar Neapolitan pizza is an incredibly hot wood burning oven. This one, brought over from Italy, burns at a scorching 900 degrees. So it only takes two minutes for the pies to cook. There we go. Wow. This is your pizza. This is stunning. God. Cheers. Cheers. Oh my goodness. Wow. This is the crust that you want on the bottom. Like thin, but you have the crunchy also. I cannot handle how much flavor is in such simplicity. I am in heaven.
At Don Antonio in New York City, I couldn't wait to try Giorgia's award-winning Montanara, a fried pizza. Fried pizza is one of the oldest pizza it was invented, created in Naples. And no you can find way. It. Yes. Wow, I had no idea. So if you see the movie with the Sofia Loren, uh -huh. the gold of Naples, okay. she was fried on the street. Women are tied to fried pizza. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, so the women in the Naples uh, try to help and sustain a the family. They were right. really poor, poor mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. So they start to fry and sell on the street. The okay, pizza. amazing. So and it really all started with the women. Let's yes. not forget that. Yes. <laughs> Georgia fries the same traditional dough to a golden brown. Then she tops it with tomato sauce, pecorino, basil, and smoked buffalo mozzarella. To get that gooey melted cheese, she finishes the pie in the oven for less than a minute. Wow, it looks so puffy. It almost looks like focaccia. It's the most delicious and simple. You get that crispy crust on the outside, but you're still getting such a doughy, light, fluffy center. You need to try at least one time in your life. Absolutely, are you kidding? I had no idea that this exists. Despite her success, Georgia knows there's still a long way to go when it comes to representation in the pizza world. In 2019, she helped co-found Women in Pizza, an organization that helps support and connect chefs, restaurant owners, and food entrepreneurs. Two of Georgia's closest friends from the group stopped by Don Antonio. The friendship that we create is more really tight, much deep friendship that you can create in the pizza world. Alexandra Mortati was inspired to start the group after talking to many women in the restaurant world with shared experiences. Alexandra, you've talked about how women are often hidden in pizza shops. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think a lot of times women get slotted into roles that people think they're best fit for. Mm -hmm. Because you're a woman, maybe you seem more nurturing, they want to put you in management or maybe you're really good with people, they want to put you as the hostess or somewhere in the front. But what you might be interested in is making the pizza, and you have to fight a lot harder for them to give you that space to prove yourself. Nicole Russell, a pizza maker who hosts the show Pizza Wars, agrees. Women just have different challenges and different barriers to entry than the average guy, and it's like, you know, one thing about being in Women in Pizza is that a lot of times when we do the show demos, I'll be the only woman with all the guys, and they're just so dominant and like, you know, we're all so passionate about making right. pizza, you know? And we all can't wait to just make the pizza, but sometimes you just gotta, uh, uh, get right. out the way, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think it's important that, you know, you always hear about a grandma slice, but actually you see a grandma representation. Yeah. <laughs> like you hear the grandma slice, but where's the grandma? Where is the grandma? Right, yeah. right, Nona's at home, right? Well, bring Nona out. Yes. So that's what Women in Pizza is kind of about. All love for just showcasing more, you know, how much women are a force in this industry. And I think now there's a lot more room where men are mentoring younger women and women are mentoring younger women um, and empowering them. And it wouldn't be possible without women like Georgia and Nicole. Cheers, ladies. Cheers. 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 Women in Pizza. Women in Pizza. Yeah, to Women in Pizza.
Where I live in the Big Apple, there are plenty of incredible pizza restaurants with pretty much every type of slice you can imagine. But there's a surprising place down south where folks are really flipping out for something special. I want to be throwing dough. I want to be covered in flour and pizza sauce. It's kind of like my serenity. Welcome to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the famed Route 66 runs right into the historic downtown. This city is known for its Art Deco buildings and world-class museums dedicated to music legends Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan. But unlike many visitors, I'm not here to dive into memorabilia. I'm here to meet Tara Hattie, a rising star on the national pizza scene. Oh my gosh, it's so good to finally meet you. Yeah. I'm obsessed with the door, master of this domain, <laughs> Tara Haddon. That's, that's epic, I love it. <laughs> Look at this beautiful restaurant. So we're just kind of a late 80s, early 90s themed pizzeria. That's what we love. As okay. a 90s baby, I, I'm all here for <laughs> it. And you're a 90s baby as well. Barely. 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 At 26 years old, Tara already owns two locations of Zaza's Pizza and Wings, a brand she founded. The name is a nod to the infamous Joey Zaza from The Godfather Part 3. Here, Tara is putting her own spin on a classic pizza shop with some very non-traditional offerings. So these are all of our slice pies. We'll usually keep like the basics and stuff that people come in to try, like of course pepperoni, cheese, right. sausage. And then we kind of have some of our weird stuff going on, of course. Pickles. Our pickle pie, and believe it or not, is one of our best-selling pizzas. No way. Tara started working in pizza when she was 16, honing her skills at local pizzerias before meeting her mentor, Mike Bausch of Andalini's Pizza, a small pizza empire in Tulsa. Mike and his brother were in and out of the restaurants all the time, and he came in and he saw me throwing dough, and every time he came in, that's what he saw me doing. So he was like, I, you're good at this, aren't you? I'm like, mm. Good was an understatement. Mike recognized that Tara had a natural talent for throwing dough, so he started teaching her some basic acrobatic tricks. Yup, this is a real sport. Professional pizza acrobats spin, toss, and twirl dough at competitions around the world. During three to five minute choreographed routines, they're judged on the number of tricks they perform and their difficulty. One of the most well-known pizza competitions is the Pizza Games at Las Vegas' Pizza Expo, where pros from around the globe gather each spring. This year, Tara is competing in her fifth games. As usual, she'll be one of the only female competitors. I didn't even learn what <laughs> pizza throwing was. I saw this guy that I worked with at like my first ever pizzeria kind of doing it. Yeah, they had told me about Pizza Expo. And at that time, it was just like a dream to go to Pizza Expo. Tara has come a long way since a disappointing last place finish at her first pizza games. Reflecting on that time, she says her head and heart were elsewhere grieving the loss of her mother, the woman who sparked her love for cooking as a child. I just kind of fell into like making food and stuff at home with my mom. Her, my grandma, long line of like young women who cook and making recipes and that was kind of what we would leave like down to our kids, but right. it was just cookbooks. When Tara returned to Vegas the following year, she had a new purpose. I made the reason I was going there worth everything that I kind of put into it. When I placed first in the preliminaries, it was such like a powerful moment. It actually fell on the anniversary of when she had passed away. So I was like, oh my gosh, like this is because of you, like you help me. <laughs> yeah. And it was kind of at that moment where I was like, everything is like paid off. When Tara's not wowing crowds, she's busy making some of Tulsa's most unique pizzas. So we headed to her prep kitchen where 500 pounds of dough gets made into over 1,000 pies every day. So our dough, we're gonna start with a local uh, milled flour. And then we of course got our yeast, salt, and olive oil. Great. Best way to kind of start dough is by activating the yeast. Okay. So we usually activate it in some hot water, warm water, like 101 is usually ideal. It's gonna smell really nice in here very soon. Yes. So give it a whisk. Great. And then once we kind of wake the yeast up in here, we're gonna put it to sleep in some ice water. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> it's cold. That's how you check your pain tolerance. Yeah, exactly. You know? It's funny that the whole point of this is to put the yeast to sleep when I'm feeling 
more awake than ever with how cold this is on my fingers. Now this is pretty bubbly, so we got a nice little foamy layer in there. And then we'll just throw this in with our flour. We already got some dough that's been mixing this morning. The dough Tara uses for tricks doesn't have any yeast, so it stays dense like Play-Doh. Back at Zaza's, it was time to learn some tossing tricks Woo! with a few new friends. Good job, good job, guys. Each month, for Tara holds a pizza making you. and throwing class for kids and parents at her shop. I'm a little older than her typical student, but I could not wait to join in on the fun. We're gonna take it across our, our body. Okay. And then throw it up. <laughs> and then throw it up in the air. Yeah, just like that. One, two, three. <laughs> I just kind of spin it like on my finger, like like my knuckles almost. Okay. But you have to get it going first. Yeah. Right? The best trick I show people okay. that's pretty easy is throwing it behind your shoulder. Okay. Show if you me that. put your arm out, you know, like your little teapot, short stout, okay. you know. And then you just look that way and throw it. It's like doing a cartwheel. I didn't, mean, it's not. Around, around the shoulder. Mm -hmm. Just like effortless. She's effortless. She's a world champion. With the competition in Vegas fast approaching, I joined Tara and her mentor Mike for a practice session. Pleasure to meet you. Mike, you're the whole reason why Tara got into this, so can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I'm a dork for pizza, and her dorkage has just latched on to us, and it's exciting. It's about the love of pizza making, and this is a representation of that. So are we <laughs> gonna get a chance to see the full routine right now? I mean, I guess. I guess we can do it. Oh my gosh. Tara uses silicone doughs to practice. They create the feel of acrobatic pizza dough without the floury mess. Transitioning from hand to hand is what will give her more points. Okay. And then going behind the back seamlessly. Some people will really lean into one trick and try and make it last 30 seconds. Okay. She's going a trick per second. Oh, oh. There it is. Okay. That's the Terra that Classic. Is. That's her signature move. Unbelievable. Hi, <laughs> girl. Woo! Here at Zaza's Pizza in Tulsa, pizza acrobat Tara Hatton is making waves with her signature moves and unique pies. I couldn't wait to make one of her fan favorites, a chicken and waffle pizza. So you're essentially taking the Zaza's Pizza and wings and you're creating a, a child with them of <laughs> chicken and waffle pizza. Yes, <laughs> they are all my precious pizza baby. We love, we love. This pizza uses a blend of margarine and butter as a base on top of the olive oil. So this doesn't have a sauce on it, does it? No, it's just gonna be like the oil on the butter. Okay, the so. olive oil is just gonna be like a sheen to protect the dough itself. And then the butter will kind of melt and create these little soup pools that'll be perfect for when we put our waffles on. And it'll just like soak up all that butter. Baby, and baby is speaking my delicious. language. With our buttery base ready, Tara and I add boneless chicken wings and mozz cheese. 
Then it was time for something sweet. Our secret little ingredient. We're gonna add yes. some syrup. Yes, look at this. It's so wrong. It's right. <laughs> so a little bit of a, Just swirl. a little swirl. So it kind of bakes into the base and stuff, and almost like caramelizes on there. The pizza bakes at 555 degrees until the crust turns golden brown before the final topping. It's smelling so good in here. It smells breakfast. like breakfast. <laughs> Jinx. Oh, we can't Wait, forget the Mike's Hot the Honey. most important part. Grizzle me timbers. Pizza time. Cheers. Cheers. So you get a combination of crunch and fluff with a little bit of that salty cheese. And, and then, then it's the, just hot. And then the hot honey. It's good. It slaps. <laughs> Of course, I couldn't leave Zaza's without trying the famous pickle pizza. I could see a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle eating this right now. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers with your hot slice of pizza. Oh my gosh. It's got that punchy vinegar pickle taste and the cheese mellows it out. I never knew that a pickle on a pizza would work so well. It does. I don't like pineapple on pizza, but like pickle on pizza, mm -hmm. that's my move. Before heading back to New York, I had one more pizza party to attend. My friend and owner of Zaza's Pizza Wings, Tara Hatton. Tara's routine wowed friends and fans of all ages who came to wish her well before the big competition. Taking it all the way back to where you first began in the kitchen with your mom and grandma mm -hmm. to where you are today. If they could see you now, what do you think they would say? I would like to say that they are definitely proud. I don't think they would expect what I'm doing now compared to where my like original game plan was in life. I think they would realize it's not just pizza to me. It is my life, it is my world, and I love it. <laughs> Tara placed second in the Masters Acrobatic Competition in Vegas. And she can't wait to come back and compete for the title again next year. Pizza is the ultimate comfort food. With so many unique styles, sauces, and toppings, it's truly impossible to go wrong. As pizza has evolved over the years, so have the chefs behind this iconic Italian staple. Whether they're cooking pies, running front of house, or going all out on stage, the women making pizza today are creating more space at the table for everyone. Mm. The rush of the water, the thrill of the catch. For many, fishing isn't just a hobby or a career, it's a lifestyle. In the U.S., women account for roughly 10% of commercial fishermen, but they've long played a vital role in the global seafood industry. I'm Elena Besser. As a chef, recipe developer, and content creator, I'm always hungry to learn more about the people who keep our food systems running. So I'm heading out to meet two women making waves in the fishing world and creating more space for everyone at the table. Welcome to the lush forests, expansive beaches, and pristine rivers of Washington State's Olympic Peninsula. Pacific Coast indigenous peoples have called these bountiful lands their home for millennia. The Quinault Indian Nation is one of many tribes that fishes, hunts, and forages here. As a non-native, I'm fortunate to be invited to the Quinault Reservation by fishing guide and tribal member, Ashley Lewis. When I think about the rivers, the oceans, the lakes out here. What I think about is home. Ashley comes from a long line of Native Americans who fished these waters for years. In the 1850s, many tribes were forced to give up their land for white settlements, but they retained fishing and hunting rights on traditional lands. During the 1960s, as Washington State began infringing on those rights, Native Americans staged a series of protests known as fish-ins. These protests led to a landmark Supreme Court decision that protects Native fishing rights to this day. 
One activist at the forefront of that movement was Janet McLeod, dubbed the Rosa Parks of the American Indian Movement. Her advocacy has inspired generations of indigenous trailblazers, including my guide. When they were forced to cede their land for newcomers, their waterscapes, the rivers, the lakes, it makes so much sense that that was the thing that's like, no, we have to have this because it's so essential to who we are. Quinault tribal members have exclusive hunting and fishing rights on a portion of this river. I couldn't wait to see Ashley's favorite fishing spots with the help of fellow guides Ruben Estevio and John Tater Bryson. If you want to think like a fish, just think like a really lazy person. Great. Like, what is going to be the easiest thing to do? Uh huh. Is it, do you want to go up that fast water? Not really. You right. want to kind of be in like the slow, easy water. Time for a quick casting lesson. We're just going to swing straight back and then we're going to swing straight forward. You can kind of feel when the current catches it. Okay. Go ahead and give it a shot. That was a good cast. Thank that was you. a great cast. That's high praise coming from Ashley, who's been a guide here for the past decade. Now she's become something of a celebrity among outdoor enthusiasts, amassing a large following on social media where she goes by the handle Bad Ash. Her YouTube and Instagram pages are chock full of how-to videos and inspiring content from her many outdoor adventures. Can you explain to me some of the, you know, stereotypical experiences that you have had that have been a little bit tough as a female fisherman in this community? Being a woman in a male-dominated sport poses challenges. Some people want me to stay in a lane that isn't my lane. I would like to see the outdoor industry be more welcoming to women. I would like to see it be more welcoming to women of color and people of color. I feel really proud to get to chip away at that on my own terms. There we go. Reconnecting with the Quinault and their fishing traditions has been a journey for Ashley. She grew up removed from her tribe, living an hour off the reservation with her mom and two siblings. I grew up in a really small community, moved to a smaller community, one stop light in town sort of deal. And you had two options, you um, get in trouble or you go fishing, okay. and I picked fishing. <laughs> I love it. And why did your mom choose to raise you off of the reservation? She experienced a lot of adversity as a younger woman and as a Native American woman. And so some of that adversity caused her to be really protective of her kids and she wanted us to love our culture. The Quinault are a matriarchal society. Women serve as the head of the household and often take on tribal leadership roles. The women here also help with traditional food gathering. Ashley grew up fishing with her mom, but didn't always appreciate the cultural meaning behind these trips. Tell me a little bit about how you met your tribal family. So about the time that I got a driver's license and I could take myself fishing, <laughs> things really changed for me. <laughs> and so I would kind of drive out to the reservation, explore a little bit, being out there among other Quinaults, fishing for salmon, that's everything that I needed. Yeah. And so that moment was profound to me. John Tater Bryson, one of the first professional guides she met on the reservation, soon became her mentor. I was taught from a young age how to harvest elk and deer and fish. And it's passed on to the younger people, so the tradition will keep going. I think I got something. Oh, you definitely do. What a cutie. Oh, hey, my guy. Bye. Ashley enjoys showcasing this beautiful place to new people, but she's also made it her mission to call out the effects of climate change to this land. What we're seeing here, this is a big slide, and we're seeing a lot of this along our river, and this is the effects of climate change. She's currently earning a PhD in Indigenous Studies, with plans to educate people about the tribes of the PNW and the environmental threats they face. With the weather warming, with different rain patterns, it changes the river, but it also changes where fish are going to be spending time. Fishing guides are like an indicator species because we're the ones out in the river day in and day out. We're the ones who see changes happening really quickly. Because of the climate threats to the Quinault, the Biden administration granted the tribe $25 million to help relocate members in flood-prone areas. This is, you know, ancient village sites. This is burial ground sites. And so to see those places washed away, this is a really significant blow to us. Indigenous people are generally the first impacted by climate change, especially if you're situated right on the Pacific Ocean. 
Sustainability practices are tenets for the Quinault. Three tribal-run fish hatcheries help maintain the populations of salmon and trout species that call this river home. Every spring, millions of salmon and steelhead are released from these hatcheries. So we were a few miles upriver fishing, mm -hmm. but now we're here at the mouth. The Pacific Ocean is right on the other side of our fish house here, and this is where tribal members come and set their nets and commercially fish for blueback sockeye. It's the only place in the world where our blueback sockeye run, so okay, it's an great. incredibly special fish to us. Commercial salmon fishing is a big part of the economy on the res. The most efficient way to get a big catch is by using a method called gill netting. Gill nets are placed near the mouth of the river to catch salmon by the gills as they head upstream. Whoa, double trouble. That's a huge one. As a chef, I've cooked fish many different ways, but this was the freshest catch I've ever tried. Cooking salmon the way her tribe has for generations is a cherished pastime for Ashley, who celebrates her culture through food. The fish is a really wonderful, tasty, oily fish, mm -hmm. and we just want to highlight the greatness that already lives here. A little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. The flavor that we're going to give it really is going to come from the alder fire and the cedar sticks. After the fish is on the pole, it's supported with cedar sticks woven across the filet. The salmon cooks until it turns light pink, another five minutes, then it's ready to serve. So now we can enjoy ourselves some Quinault fish sticks. Let's do it. Oh my gosh. Mm. I'm never ever going to look at a normal fish stick ever again in the same way. <laughs> comes right off of that skin. It really doesn't need anything else. Let the food shine. Absolutely. Yeah. After an incredible day of catching and cooking fish on the Quinault River, it was time for a trip to the beach. At sunrise, my guide Ashley Lewis and tribal biologist Scott Mazzoni are ready to show me another local pastime, digging for razor clams. Can you tell me a little bit more about what we're doing today? We are getting ready to have uh, uh, home use digs, subsistence digs, and commercial digs of razor clams. And before we do that, we gotta go out and get clam samples and test them to make sure there's no toxins in them and they're self, uh, safe for people to eat. Pacific razor clams are a meaty shellfish with an oblong shell. They can grow up to six inches. They're also a delicacy here and a major part of the quinault diet. So we're gonna use these spade tempered shovels. They're kind of curved in a way that makes it easy for us to dig the clams. Great. So we're gonna head out to the surf. We're gonna look for clam shows. As we walk towards the surf, Ashley points out small holes and dimples in the sand. These are known as clam shows, evidence that razor clams are just beneath the surface. That looks like a good spot. Whoa! There we are. 
Down here they have their foot and that they can use to dig very quickly down into the sand. Hey. He's like, I'm out of here. Thank you and goodbye. Ooh. I gotta tell you, even though it's 5 a.m., all of this razor clam digging is making me extremely hungry and ready to eat them. And they are as delicious as they are fun to dig. It was finally time for me to see what all the fuss is really about. At nearby Ocean Crest restaurant, razor clams are a menu staple. Head chef Amanda Yeager has prepared a few of their signature dishes made with fresh local clams. On the menu, a panko crusted razor clam steak served with pickled onions and a chili aioli. There's also a razor clam omelet, plus a flatbread topped with Amanda's house-made razor clam sausage. Mmm. There's a common misconception with large clams, you know, oh, would it taste rubbery, but this does not at all. That's a lot of how it's treated. It's, you know, low and slow heat, and that's why they maintain their flavor and their texture. Respect. Wow. So much. Everyone knows and loves a chicken cutlet. This is so tender on the inside. You're getting an amazing crisp exterior. That crunch and acidity coming from the onion, it is the perfect bite. As my time on the Quinault land comes to a close, I'm already sad to leave this incredible place. Ultimately, at the end of the day, if you could say one thing to the people that are watching this, what, what would you want them to know? about you and about this community. My very favorite piece about guiding is not actually the fishing. It is the way that it changes the way people start seeing the natural world. It could tell a lot about history. It could give you a lot of information. But I do know from my experience that when people are there and experience it, they're going to become curious, and that's what I want the most. to high-end seafood, lobster is pretty much king. Maine is the largest lobster producer in the country, with catchers here harvesting over 100 million pounds of the crustacean every year. I've just always admired the fishermen, and to even be able to say that I'm a fisherman just means so much to me. Sadie Samuels is the only female commercial lobster boat captain in the small town of Rockport. Her day starts before sunrise when she buys bait for her traps. Hi, hey, Sadie. welcome. Oh, it's so great to find you. Look at this stunning place of work. Are you kidding? 
With its rocky underwater terrain and cool waters year-round, the Gulf of Maine is a perfect home for lobsters. Bye, guys. The lobster industry here generates over $1 billion for the state. But those big bucks aren't made easily. Fishing for lobsters is one of the most dangerous professions. The fatality rate is 2.5 times the national average. Can you tell me a little bit more about how dangerous this job actually is? It's one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. The first funeral I ever went to was one of the fishermen in my harbor who went out by himself and he got rope, like, die on, so he on drowned. lobster. Yes, he drowned. Why do you stay in this despite all of the pain and dangers that you experience on a day-to-day -day basis? I have literally never imagined doing anything else with my entire life. Sadie's passion for fishing stems from her childhood. Her father, Matt Samuels, has been catching lobsters for over 60 years. He was up before sunrise and out the door, and then he'd get home and he'd just work until dark and come in and eat dinner and pass out. So the only way I could really hang out with him was if I wanted to like get involved with what he was doing. And then I just stuck around and I never left. <laughs> When she was just seven, Sadie got her student lobster license. She began working right away, dropping a couple traps off her dad's boat for extra cash. By age 14, she saved enough money to buy the boat she still fishes with today. I don't think I fully considered that it was like my career or gonna be my career until a little bit later in life, until I was like 14, 15. I love how you said later in life when I was about 14. I just <laughs> started getting serious about it. You were 14. That is hilarious and amazing. After studying art in college, Sadie quickly returned to a life at sea. Like when I'm out here, I'm just like, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Today, Sadie doesn't just catch lobsters, she also dishes up fresh lobster rolls at her sea-to-table restaurant, also named Must Be Nice. I would like you to walk me through your day from start to finish, so lay it on me. <laughs> so my average day is waking up around four o'clock, quarter to four, go to the boat, and then we haul about 250 traps, crate up the lobsters that we're bringing over to the restaurant, and then the restaurant closes at seven. In Maine, just 15% of lobster licenses are held by women. But anyone who catches lobsters is called a lobsterman, which Sadie stands behind. How do you feel about the term lobsterman? I'm very much on the side of like, I'm a fisherman, I'm a lobsterman. I've busted my butt and paid my dues. Nothing I do really has to do with my gender. Maine fishing laws have strict limits on the number of traps new lobstermen can set. Over time, they can acquire more traps, but it can take several years to make a livable wage. How did you get savvy with making sure that you could function as a successful business? That's actually how I started Must Be Nice Lobster, is on Saturdays, someone was looking for someone to sell lobsters at a farmer's market. I started selling live lobsters there, and then now we're here. The trap limits are part of Maine's successful conservation efforts. In the 90s, there were around 37 million pounds of lobster in the Gulf of Maine. Today, it's nearly 120 million pounds. Fishermen actually were the ones who started to put a lot of those practices in place. Those regulations impose strict sizing guidelines. Sadie actually throws back many of the lobsters she catches. That one will be good Small lobsters are too young for sale, while many older, large lobsters get thrown back to breed. So this is a, a big hard shell female. You can see on her, if you turned her the other way, She's it's the second terrain swimmerette has this mutilation on it. Got it. Which means that someone else has caught her before with eggs on it. A keeper lobster has a body that measures between three to five inches. It can take a lobster about seven years to reach that size. Finally, a lobster that was just right. Look at those claws. Nice male, really gorgeous lobster. He's definitely a keeper. Yeah, you're coming home with us, babe. Climate change is making these size regulations more crucial than ever. 
The Gulf of Maine is one of the Earth's fastest warming bodies of water, which can make lobsters more vulnerable to disease and less likely to reproduce. Why is sustainability so important to you? We're so connected with nature and so connected with our environment that it like feels like our duty. At Sadie's restaurant, she's dedicated to sourcing her ingredients sustainably. The lobster chowder uses a seafood stock made from an invasive crab species. And she's adding a new locally raised item to the menu. This season we're adding in oysters and I'm super excited because we're trying to focus as much as we can on female owned farms and also the quality of the seafood is like outstanding. To get a sneak peek at her new menu offering, Sadie took me to meet farm manager Bonita Johnson at Wright Cove Oyster Farm. So tell me a little bit more about these oysters. We're a small operation here, and so we do kind of everything by hand. Wow. And uh, yeah, they're raised with love. You and, can taste it. And yeah, <laughs> you really can. Do you want to try one real quick? Um, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> Sorry. I've been waiting over here. <laughs> Here we go, cheers. Cheers. These wow. are hands down some of my favorite oysters mm. ever. So clean, but briny. I've never had anything like this before. I'm blown away. You don't do anything in the working waterfront type of industry unless you have passion for it. Mm -hmm. And that's a really nice thing for us to like get to share with each other. Yeah. This is definitely my happy place. Back at Must Be Nice, Sadie is steaming our catch before picking meat for her signature lobster rolls. Hey, fresh caught, fresh cooked. I just had to know the secrets behind the Sadie sauce lobster roll. So how did you come up with the sauce? So I've had plenty of people, you know, from away say that Maine's lobster rolls are really boring. And I kind of took offense to that. I was yeah. like, you know what? I gotta come up with something that like packs a punch, has a bit of a spice. It starts with shallots, celery, and parsley blended in a food processor. Sadie then adds a not so secret blend of dried herbs and spices. Can you reveal what's it's in this spice It's mainly blend? paprika. The spicy part is cayenne. A mix of lemon juice and rice wine vinegar kick up the acid. And then there's a generous squeeze of stone ground mustard. Now we just add in the rest of this olive oil and then I'm gonna blend it for a little while until that just seems totally incorporated. There we go. Ooh, that is gorgeous. And that is the Sadie sauce. Sadie packs each toasted bun with a hefty handful of lobster meat. Look at this. Are you kidding me? To finish, a sprinkling of homegrown chives. I can't wait to try that. I'm so pumped. 
Inspired by Sadie's creativity, I wanted to make something special, a lobster BLT. One of my favorite foods in the summertime is a BLT. And mm -hmm. it really screams summer. And also what screams summer is a juicy lobster roll. So I figured they would pair beautifully together. We're starting with cherry tomatoes. And the reason why I slice the tomatoes first is because I like to hit them with a little bit of salt. Yes, I brought oh, yeah. a little flaky salt. And what this is gonna do is it's really just gonna pull out all those flavors and make them taste as juicy and delicious as possible. This is my best pal mayo. I spice up my mayo with grated garlic, the juice and zest of a lemon, black pepper, and chives. It's such an honor to like cook with the lobster that you have caught. So I just, <laughs> first of all, wanna say thank you because this is like the coolest. You are more than welcome. It is my joy. This is a meat lover's dream, so we're going to add two pieces of bacon Woo! on either side. We're then going to take a gorgeous lettuce leaf, and that's like the boat that's going to catch all that sauce for us. Just add the lobster, cherry tomatoes, and a final sprinkle of chives. Voila. Well, that is gorgeous. And there you go, BLT lobster roll. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh, this might fall Cheers. over me. If it does, it's part of the fun. Cheers. Mmm. <laughs> Holy moly. Oh man. This is insane. This Sadie sauce is slamming. Hubba hubba. I'm honestly having a hard time hearing what you're saying because <laughs> I'm having a moment with this one over here. Oh my god. This is literally perfection. Yay. At dinner, I couldn't wait to learn more from the women here who support each other through their passion for fresh local seafood. When people see that this is a sea to table restaurant and then they find out that you ladies were the ones that actually caught and grew the food that is being served here, what do they say to you? I feel like people, they're super excited about it and really happy that they found us. Then they can taste it with the quality of our seafood or they're in complete disbelief in like, okay, yeah, but your dad caught these. So they're literally saying to you, <laughs> no, this is a man's job. Well, I think some people have been a little too sheltered and just haven't gotten to see what us women can do. <laughs> Amen and it's up to that. us to show them. Honestly, that's Cheers. another opportunity to <laughs> toast. I love it. Time to dig in. Mm. I'm really into this BLT one. This is going on the menu, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Elena's roll. We're gonna call it Elena's roll. <laughs> Ladies, this is a dinner I will never forget, so I truly can't thank you enough for all of your hard work in making this happen, and thanks for hanging out with me. <laughs> From the smoky salmon of the Quinault Nation to the buttery, sweet lobster of Maine, I'm in awe of our nation's most delicious seafood. But I'm most inspired by the women paving their own paths in this industry and ensuring future generations will have plenty of fish in the sea. Mishama Bailey has become one of America's most distinguished chefs. She's working in kitchens from France to right here in New York City, but it was her love of Southern cooking that lured her back to the South. We're gonna cook with her in a minute, but first, a look at her culinary journey. All these breakfast items are real improvement. Like, they really kind of boost up the menu in a really good way. And it's so happy. Mashama Bailey has much to be happy about these days. At 48, Chef Bailey's career is booming, a double James Beard award winner, including Outstanding Chef. Her debut restaurant, The Gray, in Savannah, Georgia, is a destination, and she recently opened two more eateries in Austin, Texas. We connected with this city just like we connected with Savannah. Austin was a good fit. A New York City girl who spent her formative years in Georgia. Chef Bailey is a French-trained chef who leans hard into her Southern roots. My mom is Southern and spent a lot of summers there. I've been pretending to be Southern all my life, you know? I just love, I love the camaraderie of the South. I love my family's history and I love how it shines through 
and food. And it was that time spent in her grandmother's kitchen which made Chef Bailey fall in love with cooking. She could turn something out of nothing. She always had a pot on the stove. It came from so much love, and it didn't really come from like this an abundance of having. It was like what she had, she shared. And I really tried to embody that. After an internship in France and a short stint as a personal chef, she landed a sous chef position in New York City. My most transformative time, me becoming serious about this profession, was my time at Prune. I think working for Gabrielle Hamilton was very eye-opening. Her food was very comforting, very classic. And I thought that I was becoming not only a better chef in that environment, but a better person. And in a male-dominated field, it was mostly women who impacted Chef Bailey's culinary journey until she partnered with Jono Morisano in The Gray. When I met Jono, it was kind of serendipitous. It was like, oh wait, I lived in Savannah as a kid. I want to move to the South. I want to be an executive chef at a restaurant. Okay, let's go see what this is about. But the location Jono chose for their joint venture gave Chef Bailey some pause. I've never seen a Jim Crow era bus station before. It was segregated, it has a dark history, but me standing in the segregated waiting room for colored people, I felt like there was some good vibrations in that space and I felt like I was gonna do good things there and I wanted to try. They chronicled that journey together in their memoir, Black, White, and the Gray, the story of an unexpected friendship and a beloved restaurant. Ticket, order fire, meatball, clam, and a fish toast. And that beloved restaurant, featured in Netflix's Chef's Table, continues to delight diners with fresh southern ingredients along with special touches from Chef Bailey's childhood. After the guests have dinner, we clear their plates and we give them a thrill. Locals would come in and be like, what? You know what a thrill is, what? That made me feel good because they understand that I have roots here. It's a little part of my history on the plate. Oh okay. my God, we're so excited that you're here. I'm just so in awe of what you've, what you've created. Um, it's like roots and wings, man, you have it all. Yep. You said your mom didn't want you to become a chef initially? No, or my father. They yeah. both thought that it was domesticated positions oh. and they just felt like I was gonna be broke for the rest of my life, so. <laughs> so you're like, hey, now, what do they think? <laughs> they think, uh, they, they're very proud, oh. very proud. You know, proud. I, I, what I love is that you're you brought us these three yeah, yep, want, but yep, you yep. learned all of your your love of cooking from your grandma yeah yeah because it was you know we didn't mm -hmm. have much oh and we um well let me tell you what a thrill well, is. Yes, yeah, tell us. so tell. a thrill is something that women from the neighborhoods in savannah mm. would make for the children of the neighborhoods in savannah and usually made of very inexpensive ingredients like kool-aid sugar water yeah. maybe like if you spent 25 cents on a thrill instead of 10 cents, mm -hmm. then you would have fruit cocktail in it or something uh -huh. like a nice surprise. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. But it was, I mean, the Savannah summers are brutal yeah. and they last forever. And so it's really nice mm -hmm. in the summertime when mm -hmm. the humidity is high and the heat is high that you can actually have something to cool so you what, off. What's in this one? That's a grapefruit, pink grapefruit it's thrill. It's delicious. So it's um, some grapefruit juice and um, this is not, we don't do Kool-Aid at the restaurant, just going. to clarify. <laughs> I was gonna say, we had a feeling you did. You're a James Bond winning chef. So it's just grapefruit juice, a little bit of syrup, uh, simple syrup, sugar and water, and um, some ginger.
about New Orleans is the delicious food from po' boys to beignets and every single thing in between. Yeah, and of course, one of the most legendary restaurants here is Commander's Palace. This woman right here, Meg Bickford, is the executive chef who is not only creating unforgettable food, but lasting memories. Take a look. <laughs> only in New Orleans. Is your meal accompanied by a three-piece band and a second line through the restaurant? Or at least that's the tradition at world-famous Commander's Palace. Opened in 1893, it's a New Orleans institution. Chefs from Paul Prudhomme to Emeril Lagasse have created staples in the kitchen. But now there's a new top chef at the helm. That's the Houchangale Eggs Benedict. Meg Bickford made history in 2020 when she was named the first female executive chef of Commanders after starting her culinary journey back there in 2008. I started as a garmage cook. Um, I was working hot apps and salads um, straight out of culinary school. And food has always been her biggest motivation. I grew up in a big South Louisiana family. My family, we grieved over food, we celebrated over food. I just knew that that needed to be a big part of my life. So beautiful. Her culinary style is inspired by the rich culture around her. Louisiana is a sportsman's paradise, right? So what we have access to, produce and seafood and game, is kind of unmatched. We in this industry are so lucky to be here because the city celebrates what we do just so wholeheartedly. The same way that the city celebrates music. Set her aside on this pickup. Every day, Chef Mag brings her leadership skills to the table. This restaurant is a place of learning. Hey, hey Chef, what can I do for you? Chef Mag has this kind of grit in her hustle. She listens to her team. She celebrates their, their accomplishments. But if she sees a deficiency, she's going to nurture that. She's really one of the best role models that I could have ever asked for. Um, she's always encouraging me to uh, try new things and to just do better. And it really is a recipe for success. I want to create a memory for someone that when they think about it or they smell bread pudding, it brings them here. They could just be in this moment and be here and let us worry about everything else. And you just sit and enjoy. Um, can we just toast? Royalty! Can we toast? It's about time. The first <laughs> female chef of you do Commanders. A you made this cocktail for us. I what, did. Is, what is this called, This Meg? is the Tequila Mockingbird number two. Right? Okay. So oh. super simple but fantastic. We like that pun. And great for this kind of weather. Cheers to you. Mm. Mm. Thank you, ladies. Meg. Oh my god. Tequila, Meg. limoncello, a little Ooh. Angostura bitters. Oh. Come on. Let's put this down so you, you know can get to I like work. my big girl cocktails, right? That's a big I girl. I do, I do. <laughs> All right, what are you cooking up for us, man? So we're gonna do uh, Louis Armstrong eggs. So okay. this is one of my all-time favorite brunch dishes at Commander's. Looks like you put the Trinity in there. Is we that put right? Trinity in there, of course. Right. All great things start with that. Um, we're going in with some garlic. That's a lot. Get it in, is. Girl. <laughs> going in with jalapeno, a lot again. And we're going to cook all this down until it's opaque, right? So okay. a little translucent. Okay. Then we're going to add one of my favorite ingredients to our red beans. What? Pickled pork. Ooh, How do you so pickle it? We don't know what pickled pork means. <laughs> So it's kind of like salted pork, okay? okay? So it's going to season a lot of this pot. So we're not going to actually season our beans until they're nice and tender. I'll help you, sir. Thank you. Into that go our red beans. So you, those are uncooked. You just plop them in. Right? You I soaked them soak overnight. Yeah, exactly right. Down. So they don't take, you know, all day to cook. What's but going they will on with that broth? What is that? Ooh. That's some chicken stock, chicken right? Stock. So we're building lots of flavors Look here with our oh. trinity, with our garlic, with our jalapenos, our chicken stock, our pickled pork. We're going to let this cook for hours and hours and hours. Hours. Right? Okay. So okay. we're moving on. Bye. So we so what have here. What's in there? This is a dirty rice cake. So we've got Trinity, again, lots of garlic, house made smoked on Dewey sausage, and our po Louisiana popcorn rice. Okay? Yes. Form that into a cake. We're going to go over here. Wait, what, what are you is putting that? on there? This is our red beans. Oh. We pureed them super, super look at that. smooth. Amazing. Right? So look they're nice and it. velvety. Wait, look what's happening. Yes. Look right? at that, Jim. Yes. Are you yes. seeing it? And this is rice. taking too long, so we're going to move on. Okay. We've got our beautiful crispy rice cake Ooh. here. Now, you said there's an egg. What's happening? There's the poached egg. So you poached it. It's brunch, honey. We're all about the Bro. eggs. Now, Same what's this delicious sauce on top? Yeah. So over here, we have mm, um, that. Hollandaise. hollandaise. Look, look. Our hollandaise is studded with smoky house-made mm. tasso. Mm. Here, we'll share. You want to share? Yeah, let's share. And we're going to do some... Wait, is there more? Beautiful green onions right on, on top. Come on, Come on. 
Meg, this is Meg. delicious. It's good, right? Meg. Mm. Oh my god. I'm mm. so glad y'all enjoy it. Mm. I mean, that is amazing. Oh my. The best part about brunch at Commanders, yeah. outside of the food and the cocktails and the service and all the environment, is the second line. But you can't do it without your own second line umbrella. Oh my Wait, gosh. No. What? Wait. So, no, you didn't. Jenna! Oh, huh? oh my god. I've always wanted Wait. one of these. Come on. Thank you, Meg. Oda. Are you kidding? <laughs> Oh my God! Now Personal. Second line we style. love you, man. Thank you, Meg. Thank you. We love you. Get these delicious recipes. Head to today.com/slash food. Okay, you know that in that moment, Hoda, where you take a bite of something mm -hmm. so delicious mm -hmm. you can actually taste the love that went into it. Well, that is the kind of food that Harlem chef Tammy Treadwell makes, and her cooking is just part of what draws the crowds in. Take a look. That's love. Wait till you so taste that. Right in the heart of Harlem in a 15 square foot food truck. I got po po boys here. Yes, that's me. You'll find po boys, shrimp and grits, and a whole lot of good vibes. I tell people all the time on my corner on 125th Street, there's nothing but love. Love and Harlem are two things that are part of Chef Tammy Treadwell's DNA. In this neighborhood that's in every part of who you are. We are sitting in the Harlem Rose Garden. This is like so surreal because I've often said I'm that flower or that rose that will break through the concrete. No matter what you pour on me, I'm going to emerge stronger and stronger. Throughout Tammy's sometimes challenging life, food has been what she calls her love language. I cannot talk about food without talking about my grandmother because her spirit is with me everywhere I go. I got my love of cooking from hanging around in the kitchen with her, not wanting to go outside because she was cooking and I wanted to be first in line to get the plate. There was a lot of people in my house. <laughs> After surviving cancer and getting laid off from her job, Tammy felt a calling to feed people. I'm taking care of all the flavors. In 2016, she broke through the male-dominated food truck industry and opened Harlem Seafood Soul. The idea that you had, like, all the things you had to overcome in your life. At your core, are you an optimist? Unbelievably. We live in a world of possibilities. I'll show you it can be done. Then in March of 2020, the unthinkable happened. Tammy was forced to shut her truck down. Then her husband, Greg, passed away from COVID. What did you lose that day? I lost my best friend. We had 38 amazing years mm -hmm. together. One thing I know for sure is that man loved me. I have never had a doubt that his love is real. There's a period in between fetal position mm -hmm. and standing up. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And there's mm -hmm. something that happens in that moment where it changes. What made you say, it's time to get out from under these covers? Mm -hmm. I started seeing the faces of the people in my family. They were looking at me for the first time like they were very concerned. Every time I would hit a wall emotionally, where I felt like, you know, I'm, today, I, today's not the day. I'm gonna lay back down today. Mm -hmm. And my granddaughter would say to me, Grandma, when are you going to cook for the people again? This time I looked at her like, you know, that's a good question. You know what we love about you is that you're not only sharing your love through your food, you're also sharing your love through helping others. Mm -hmm. That was the only motivation I had to cook, was to do something for someone else. I had to put my grief on the mm -hmm. side and move forward, mm. and that's what I did. When when the doors opened, mm. and did you wonder, are they gonna remember me? Yeah, I stood there for a little while like, okay, I know y'all smell me. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally turned around, um, to, I guess stir the grits or do something, and when I turned back around, there was a line yeah. here. Mm. There was a line, oh. and there had to be, you know, at least a dozen people standing yes. in line, and they were waiting for me, <laughs> and they were smiling, and they were like, where you been? Oh. And we're glad to see you back here. Harlem is a village. That's how I was always raised to believe. There's a lot of love in this village. Mm. Just wait till you get the experience. We let's go. All right. Yes, let's go. Today, just shy of 60 and after a lifetime of hardship, Chef Tammy says she's in her prime and she'll remain on that corner as long as the community allows her to stay. Jenna, I'm going to give you a little bit. Thank you. Be okay, careful. ready? 
I have worked so hard for so many years and now I get to do what makes me happy. Is she, she's amazing. We love her so much. Is it difficult to, to make this walk? One block is over three years of work and grace. This moment for Martha Gilreath has been years in the making. Where did you live? Uh, right on that side, right by these columns is where I'd usually stay. So this was your roof? It's dark and it's kind of chilly and it's, it's dismal. After years of addiction and homelessness, Martha is finding gratitude in this second chance. It's surreal. A lot of it was really, really rough and ugly, and it just gets more beautiful every day now. My childhood was unbelievable, and I have five siblings. My parents have been married 43 years. We always had fun, and there was so much love. Someone hearing that would wonder, what happened? I thought people that were alcoholics or addicts came from a certain background. Girls like me who went to Cotillion and went to a good high school don't end up like that, and the truth is, this thing that I have, it, it doesn't care. It started, someone had some cocaine in a party and I thought, oh, this, this is fun and it was scary and it was exciting. Eventually that progression looks like for me going to harder drugs and violence and homelessness and jails and hospitals. I was in active addiction for 16 years. And at some point you wake up and it's living under the bridge. It's the scariest, because you're never safe. When did you make that decision where I'm willing to put in that work? I'm gonna turn it around. I think that the willingness to put in the work and then a moment of grace have to align. I called my friend, Jesse, and I asked her if I could come home. I cannot live like this anymore. In December of 2019, Martha entered into a recovery center in Charleston, South Carolina, and that's where everything changed. Food for so long for a lot of us is survival and so when people start to get sober and they start to enjoy food again there was a kid there turning 21 in rehab someone had told me that he loved cheesecake loved cheesecake so like, i'll make a cheesecake you know I, I can figure that out and then i see him with his new friends and he is smiling after watching this kid enjoy the cake i I'd never had any direction. I'd never followed anything through. And I said, I'm going to go to culinary school. So Martha returned to New Orleans in September of 2020 and received a scholarship to Noki, the New Orleans Culinary and Hospitality Institute, just one block from where she once lived underneath the bridge. It was very scary, but also it required all of the same things that sobriety requires of me, following direction, patience, taking your time, doing it someone else's way. And it was through baking where Martha thrived. 
Defying all odds, she graduated as valedictorian of her class. When you look at, at who she's become, in the kitchen and out, what do you think? Pride. I'm really, really proud of her and really excited for her and not too surprised, honestly. It's everything that's inside of her that, that's come out. In the years since graduation, Martha has become an executive chef at a local restaurant and has started her own pop-up bakery called Nolita. We're gonna do a play on a morning roll. Yeah. Beautiful color, oh, and it's really goodness. fragrant. Oh my gosh! <laughs> That's amazing! And one of the chefs that has always inspired Martha is restaurateur and Food Network host, Guy Fieri. He's about bringing joy. Mm -hmm. He wants to make people's experiences and lives better all around food. And Guy had a special message for Martha. Chef Martha, your buddy Guy Fieri here. You are a warrior. You have been through it all. And to just think that I make you happy and I make you smile, that you love food and enjoy it the way I do, well, my sister from another mister, I look forward to meeting you. I make it through New Orleans. I'm coming to Nolita. I'll be looking for you. Whew. <laughs> A lot of surreal things have happened to me lately, but that's at the top of the list. <laughs> Whew, thank you for that. What's next for you? I don't know. And I think that's the exciting part. I, you know, one day, I hope Nolita becomes brick and mortar. What food does for us is its service to making memories. And so if someone could come in Nolita and then 10 years from then say, oh, that's where my dad used to take me. I just want keep being hopeful and grateful. If there are any parents watching, I just want them to know that their babies can still come home. There is always hope. It's a sisterhood of restaurants with a purpose, run by young women, finding inspiration in their own stories. Chef Zyla Cadillo taps into her Mexican heritage to create her cuisine. My restaurant is Etheria. It is a mess camel bar with vegan-inspired Mexican dishes. Chef Shanari Freeman leans into her southern roots for recipes. My restaurant is called Caden. It is southern soul food, plant-based focus. And Chef Amara Garib, daughter of an Ecuadorian mother and an Egyptian father, gets her inspiration from her father, who operated a pizza parlor. My restaurant is called Soda Club. It's a wine bar, and it's plant-based uh, Italian fresh pasta. Did you catch this detail? All three skip the animal products, but not the flavor. Okay, I have to say, when you hear Italian food, when you hear Mexican food, when you hear soul food, I mean, there's a lot of cheese in those. There's a lot of meat in those. I'm Mexican. I grew up with my mom making Mexican food. How is it to make these particular types of food plant-based? For soul food, one thing you have to definitely focus on is the flavor profile. So just playing around with textures a lot, uh, different flavors, cooking techniques. I think the Italian food, you just stick with fresh pasta, you can't go wrong. Mexican people are indigenous people, and a lot of our food is from nature and from the gum. So I feel like it easily translated to being vegan. Raise your hand if you're a vegan. Okay, so Mira, you're not. What was this process like? I mean, were you like missing 
the cheese at all on top of a pasta or no? It's really easy to just cover something in cheese and it's delicious <laughs> and then it tastes good. <laughs> yeah. It was more challenging because I was just trying to find substitutes to make it more traditional but not traditional at the same time. We yeah. also have a group chat where one of us will be like, this is a whack cheese, don't use it, or this <laughs> yeah. is a really good one, you should try it out, stuff like that. You're all under 30 and you have the titles of executive chef at restaurants in New York City. I mean, how cool is that? Pretty cool. <laughs> How's this been to go through together? Better than going alone. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's true. We're able to learn a lot from each other mm -hmm. um, and also learn a lot about ourselves, how we cook, and how to run restaurants. Their boss had full faith they could do just that. Ravi DeRossi, founder and CEO of Overthrow Hospitality, who owns all the restaurants, decided to give them a shot at starting their own culinary concepts when they were working at the company in different positions. Was it this purposeful decision to give three women of color this opportunity to be executive chefs of New York City restaurants? I think subconsciously intentional, mm. if that makes sense. Mm. They were already in the company and the best suited for these positions. Over 65% of our 300 some odd employees were women and people of color. So we made the very clear decision to put more people of color in places of authority. So as they're hiring, they see through the lens of their selves. Of course, a taste test had to be part of this assignment to see how they stand up to the real thing. First, plant-based Italian from the Soda Club. So where should I start? Definitely with the ravioli. With the ravioli, okay. My favorite, yeah. That is amazing. Is it good? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm having a moment. Next, vegan-inspired Mexican food from Eteria. The mango salsa looks delicious. It was so good. Oh my goodness. And finally, I had to try a dish getting rave reviews. Fried lasagna, a soul food favorite at Cadence. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm blown away. <laughs>few things that make me happier than physically farming. Big, sweaty, kind of brutal task. I think I've always known in some form that this farm and this work around connecting people and land needed to exist. <laughs> you wanna be free of your anxiety. So catchy. I think the wind likes it. <laughs>
farmers for millennia and that our ancestors built the agricultural system of this country on their backs. I was really grateful that she was there and encouraged me to stick with it. My partner Jonah and I were living in the south end of Albany, New York with our then infant children, Nishima and Emmett, and despite our master's degrees and over a decade of farming experience, found it impossible to get fresh food for our children. There were no supermarkets, no farmers markets, no available community garden plots. The only food is a corner store, a liquor store, and a McDonald's. This system of segregation uh, is termed by the government a food desert. To us, there's nothing natural about apartheid. Um, so we call it what it is, it's food apartheid. It comes out of a legacy of redlining and housing discrimination, of divestment from communities of color, and has resulted in the situation today where if you're white, you're four times as likely to have a supermarket on your block than if you're black. You're more likely to have diabetes, heart disease, and other diet-related illnesses. Not because you don't know how to eat, but because there you know, is a scarcity of affordable, culturally appropriate quality food um, that's accessible. And so we work to establish a community garden right on the corner plot near our home. So when our neighbors found out that we knew how to farm, they encouraged us to start the farm for the people. And the idea for Soul Fire Farm was born. We purchased the land in 2006 and it took us four years to transform this marginal, degraded and vacant land into human habitat and suitable farmland. And we opened the farm in 2011 with a small food distribution program that went right to our neighbors in the South End. A couple thousand folks roll through here every year to attend our farm training programs. The rest of you are just going to contemplate um, and pray for <laughs> the strawberries. Happy, happy um, homemaking. There are eight of us working here on the farm. We have an amazing team. We have a number of day-long programs and week-long camps for youth who are interested in farming and a whole lot of community days and workshops on particular skills. It's really whatever our community is asking us for, we do our best to provide. Our most popular is the week-long BIPOC FIRE, stands for Black Indigenous People of Color, Farming in Relationship with Earth. We have folks coming from 37 states and three countries this year, Spanish and English speakers, young and old. And we spend a week together uh, doing hands on the land training. Uh, we have a number of courses on business management, marketing, uh, as well as crop planning. If you count everyone who's gone through any program, we have over 10,000 alumni. We provide ongoing and forever mentorship. We hook folks up with jobs, uh, land, fellowships, and other opportunities. You know, land is the place where the lynchings, the beatings, the enslavement, the sharecropping took place. And so there's no way to escape the trauma associated with that. And so a big part of what I and we are trying to do at Soulfire is to reach back across the narrative of the hundreds of years of land-based oppression to Cleopatra's you know, compost piles and the raised beds of the Ovambo people in Namibia, to reach back to the work of Dr. George Washington Carver, creating regenerative agriculture, and Dr. Booker T. Watley with Farm to Table. So to really reclaim the dignity of it is super important. If we can't feed ourselves, we can't truly be free. All right, so everyone who's part of the tour, just come a little bit. Get started. We're gonna travel around the farm together, get a chance to visit some of the sacred sites, hear the stories, and you can ask your questions as well as we go. So follow me this way. Community Farm Day is our monthly public event where volunteers come from all around the region to share in the labor of the land, to have a potluck lunch, and then to participate in a tour and Q&A session. It's the one time that the farm's open to the public. Now what's very important with strawberries is that their meristem or growth point is right here. So what do you think happens if you bury that? Drowning. It will not grow. <laughs> we have a bunch of different teams working on different tasks, um, including transplanting the fall strawberries, uh, cleaning and curing the garlic and onions, harvesting potatoes, removing some of the materials and supplies that we're done with for the season. And Jonah will be working with some volunteers, many of whom have traveled three or four hours just to get here today. We have a lot of teens that come through the farm and not all of them are gonna be farmers, but they see folks who look like them following their dreams and being their own bosses and running their own institutions. What matters to me is that they can see a wider vision of what's possible for their own lives.
This is what we're trying to get yeah. to, so it's great to see it in person. Yeah, just a goal. It makes my heart flutter. <laughs> like, honestly, I just, like, I'm so inspired. When I say five, you say minutes. Five. Minutes. Five. Minutes. Until lunch, which means you should please help all the teams clean up and put everything away. We do doorstep delivery of vegetables, eggs, pastured meat, and herbs, and folks can actually pay for that using their EBT benefits. The vast majority of people say that having those vegetables has made a huge difference in their health, whether that's a reduction in you know, blood pressure or cholesterol or overall sense of well-being. And especially for our lower income members, many of them say if it wasn't for those vegetables, they'd literally be eating ramen and boiled pasta and canned foods because they simply don't have anywhere to get, you know, fresh food like we offer. There's nothing that makes me happier than seeing our alumni farm. So for example, Dallas Robinson in North Carolina uh, just recently opened the Harriet Tubman farm. Folks like Keisha Cameron outside of Atlanta, Georgia at High Hog Farm. Fundamentally, I want to create a different kind of educational environment for young people that I never got to experience where you know, you can go ahead and be proud to be a soil nerd and you also will have your culture uplifted, your heritage uplifted and be affirmed for who you are and and encouraged to pursue your wildest dreams. I see Leah and I like stand there and I listen to her and I'm just in complete awe. Like, like I feel a physical reaction in my body and I just want to like be quiet and listen. I've had mixed feelings in the past around doing public speaking. It always seemed like the real work was here on the farm and then I'd go out and just talk about the real work. And something shifted for me when I witnessed how many people who heard our talks then went on to join a program to learn how to farm, or did something like give away their land to a black farmer. It's really an honor and pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I feel excited, I feel deeply pleased to talk about two of my favorite things, which are the earth and the ancestors and what they want us to be up to. Skull caps, you're gonna grow so strong. So we wrote this song. Our waiting list for our training programs is years long. Mm -hmm. Our people are yearning, right? Some of us confuse the scene of the crime, which was the land, with the crime. Mm -hmm. But the fact is the land has always had our back. In fact, we survived because of that connection with the land. My hope is that we spread our love, our knowledge, our resources out through the network of black and brown farmers so that you know, 10, 20 years from now, people will be like, wait, what's Soul Fire again? Because there's literally right around the corner a black and brown led teaching farm so that it becomes so commonplace that we have to remind our children about a time when all the land was white owned and a time when all the farmers were exploited because that's become such a distant memory.
butchery is seen as this really large scale brute force thing and it takes a lot of physical strength, but a lot of it is also really intricate and small kind of meditative moments. Sausage making being one of those things. The color is still really nice. Yeah, it looks beautiful. I'm Cara Nicoletti. I'm a fourth generation butcher and co-founder of Seymour Meats and Veggies. <laughs> I want butchers in the future to not be scared of people eating less meat. I just think that we need to get a little bit more creative about our job. Everyone, the food is ready. The mission really is to make it easier and more fun for people to eat well. It turns out that adding vegetables, making that meat stretch farther, democratizes good meat, if you will, uh, makes it more available to more people. They're just so good. <laughs> my family's history in butchery started uh, with my great-great-grandfather. He was a cattle merchant in Russia. That was where my great-grandpa started working in the meat industry. And then he opened a shop in the north end of Boston in the 1940s with some of his family. When my grandpa was 13, him and his brother, Bobby, started working in the shop and eventually took it over. Is that you? That's me, yeah. that's Bob. I'm Seymour Celeste, and I'm a retired butcher. Both of us went to work helping my dad in the meat market. My brother and I were partners until the day he passed away a couple of years ago. This was the store. Wow. 65 Salem Street. I had three daughters. I never thought that uh, my girls would be interested, and they weren't. My daughters used to bring the children into my office for me to take care of them while they went out and did things. And uh, Cara always wanted to go into the smelly room. I was, out of my sisters and my cousins, probably the most curious about what they were doing in the shop. Growing up, I always wanted to sort of like peek behind the curtain and see. I graduated in 2008, the economy collapsed. <laughs> I was working at a restaurant as a baker and one of the owners who also had a grandfather who was a butcher was like, if you ever want to do some like light butchery work, breaking down chickens and pork shoulders and stuff, let me know. So I started doing that and it sort of like sparked an interest in me. So I started apprenticing for free. I did that for about a year and then left to go butcher full time. I remember calling my papa, Seymour, when I got my first apprenticeship. I could tell that he was hoping like it was something that didn't stick. Well, I said, yeah, this is the, the funniest story, the funniest joke. You're, you're joking with me and everything else. And she said, no. I really have my entire working life worked with my hands and I enjoy that much more. I trusted her and believed in her. As a matter of fact, I gave her some of my tools. This is um, Papa Seymour's honing steel that he gave me. As soon as I started butchering full time, I gravitated toward sausage making immediately. And I realized pretty early on that I had like, hit on an idea. As much as I believe in regenerative agriculture and all of that, there's just no way to sustainably eat meat every single night of the week. So I started sneaking a lot of vegetables into my sausages. I had set out to make 40 pounds of sausages and after I'd mixed it all together, I weighed out the mix and it was like 70 something pounds. I had essentially doubled my meat <laughs> by adding vegetables to it. When I was working at Foster's and just like couldn't physically keep up with the demand was when I realized that it definitely was a scalable idea. It's been the last two years of working nonstop trying to get this to market. Uh, I went to close to 100 co-packers asking them if they would help me and every single one of them said no because what we're doing is more complicated.
We finally found one co-packer outside of uh, Kansas City, Missouri, the Phantasmas, and flew out to go see them, and they were like, sure, we'll try it. Hey! Hi! <laughs> How's it going? Good, how are you? Good. Oh, Mario! <laughs> Hi! I really owe everything to them because they saw something in me and they saw something in my idea that they thought was worth taking a risk on. I was making Lou and Mario like <laughs> peel beets and dice them in the thing that makes bologna. I believe it was the challenge. Uh, we never done sausage with vegetables and meat combined at the amounts uh, that she was looking for. We immediately saw uh, the drive that she had, the passion she had about the sausages she made. We've always wanted to work with the sausage queen. <laughs> oh my gosh! Vivi, do you want to help me prep some vegetables? We went back and forth and back and forth about the name for a long time. We had a few different iterations that just didn't stick, and I always wanted it to be Seymour. These are cooking up fantastic, <laughs> huh? God, look at those. They're just cooking up. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. I love her, and I said to her, no, 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 don't call it Seymour Meets Eventually. I wanted her to call it something like Kara's Kitchen because it really, you know, it's her, and of course I am humbled by what she did, and uh, um, I'm very emotional about that. We are all obsessed with Seymour. We love him and use him as a model of, of positivity and gratitude. That delicious. So this is about honoring my whole family. The truth of the matter is, Kara revolutionized the uh, sausage business. Make no mistake, this was not an easy process and I almost quit many, many, many times. Kara went to Whole Foods and they bought her product immediately. I mean, I can lie awake at night thinking how remarkable it is that she was able to achieve that, and I'm very proud of her. Butchering is a really, really difficult job with very little financial payoff, but I would not do anything differently. Women make really good butchers and really good cooks, really good chefs. I think the more of us that are in this industry, the better. I understand what it takes to accomplish what she's accomplished. And let me tell you, it is no easy feat. And it didn't happen overnight for Kara. And it's just the beginning as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I love you so much. Welcome to Today All Day. All day? Today All Day. All day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking, yeah, who's your okay. favorite character you've ever played? Oh, the right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> What is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cut. Cold Cut. Hi, buddy cow. Cooking with me. Dad's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today, with simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit oh, oh, oh. now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride.
food in a way unlocks a lot of stories. It's this emotional connection that we get through eating that food that is really irreplaceable. My name is Chitra Agarwal. I'm the co-founder at Brooklyn Deli, where we make sauces and condiments inspired by my family's recipes from India. My name is Katevi, and I'm the chef and owner of Dumpling Club, a weekly subscription service that features a rotating menu of dumplings and Asian dishes. I started Brooklyn Deli in 2014. Our first products at Brooklyn Deli were my achars, which are a staple Indian condiment. They're kind of like this spicy, sour, a little bit sweet. So you add just a little bit and it kind of just makes the dish like amazing. I developed a lot of the recipes for achar using what I was getting in my farm share. So I was making achar from heirloom tomatoes, garlic, gooseberries. I wouldn't say that it's authentic Indian food. It's very much inspired by my heritage, but it's authentic to me. My grandfather comes from a region in northern China that, that specializes in dumplings. And to him, dumplings were the perfect food, the best food. I use all sorts of influences in the dumplings. For example, influences from my husband's Austrian side. That's not traditionally how dumplings would be made. I'm learning to be really comfortable with that. In the beginning, I felt like that wasn't truly authentic but I actually now feel that that's very authentic to me and my experience. A labor of love learned from generations before them. The pleating sort of represents on the outside the amount of care that's been put into this food. Whenever we made them as a family, seeing the pleats that my mom or that my grandfather added to the dumplings would remind me that they were the ones who prepared this food for me. father's mother, we were just very close. I can still remember the food that she would give me. I can still taste it. They're kind of like food memories from when I was really young and those continued on as I visited her every year in India. Every trip we would be in the kitchen. Growing up, we didn't have regular access to Asian groceries, but I learned about the importance of food from my mom. She would use spaghetti whenever she was making stir-fried noodles. Her creativity, that creative spirit that she had when it came to replicating her home food through whatever ingredients that she had on hand, that's what I feel really inspired by. Both women left stable jobs for their culinary careers. It was a really scary time because, I mean, I had been working for over a decade in positions where I had benefits, I had an ongoing salary that I could count on. I left Google in the fall of 2019, and already that year I was starting to make dumplings, send them around to friends and family, and when I decided to really start in earnest was in February 2020, conveniently one month before the pandemic hit and everything shut down. I didn't have a steady job or an income at that time and whenever I had a spare moment, I'd fold dumplings and then I would stay up all hours editing footage and putting it up on Instagram and we were just trying to survive. Despite the pandemic, their businesses not only survived, but thrived. Our public sales tend to sell out within a few minutes. One time it sold out in less than a minute. For us, it's been great because more people want to try the flavors that we're putting out there and want to learn more about Indian food and culture. Everything that I really learned how to make, I learned from different family members. So I feel like in some sense, the Brooklyn Deli recipes also are a way for our family recipes to kind of live on. When my parents came to the States, they really came here with nothing. And I'm super cognizant of that now, that it's a huge privilege to be able to, to do what I love, to go after what I love. And that has come from years of sacrifice and hard work from my parents. And knowing that, 
I want to take that privilege and make sure that I do something really positive with it. Ah, pizza. The golden crust, the tangy sauce, and that ooey gooey cheese. It's no surprise that this divine creation is one of America's most popular foods. But in the countless pizzerias I've been to, it's still pretty rare to see a woman tossing dough or tending a giant oven. I'm Elena Besser. I'm a professional chef, recipe developer, and content creator, so I'm constantly curious about who is making my meals. Now I'm heading out to meet the women breaking barriers in the pizza world today and creating more space for everyone at the table. Mankind has been eating flatbreads for centuries, but the modern pizza was invented in Naples, Italy. It was popular among the working class who needed meals that were quick and cheap. When Queen Margarita of Savoy visited Naples in the late 1800s, Chef Raphael Esposito served her a pie inspired by Italy's national colors. The Queen's approval turned this humble street food into a royal favorite. So you could say it was a woman who really put pizza on the world map. I think the love from pizza is something I always say, uh, I think is my blood. Georgia Capruccio owns Manhattan's Don Antonio, known for its classic Neapolitan pies. While New York City has thousands of pizzerias, very few are actually owned by women. What do your guests say when they walk into the restaurant and they see a woman standing at the pizza oven making their pizza? So some of the people are, are really, I can see from the face, they're surprised. Wow. And they bring the kids, they bring the daughter to see, to have, you know, pizza and it's super fun. Georgia is one of only two women to ever win one of Italy's largest pizza competitions, a feat she accomplished at just 21 years old. Her victory surprised everyone, including Georgia herself. It was crazy. My father signed for me. Wait, so he signed you up to compete in this competition and yeah. you had no idea? No idea. Zero idea. Five minutes before the competition started, he came to me and said, oh, by the way, I signed up for you. Georgia placed first in the classic pizza category, cementing her love for the craft and giving her shop a major boost. I never, never imagined that I was, you know, I can win. I was super happy. That moment, it was unique because I remember feel free, feel, feel super light. Growing up on a dairy farm in Terracina, Italy, Georgia's love for pizza started early. Tell me some of your earliest food memories. So my grandmother, for example, she was making pizza for me okay. every Sunday with just tomato sauce and oregano, so really simple. So I that's true grandma-style pizza from yeah. grandma herself. Georgia's grandmother may have introduced her to pizza, but it was her father, Roberto Capruccio, that made it a true family obsession. Roberto left his family and moved to Naples to study the art of pizza making. Georgia was just eight years old, so she rarely saw him growing up. By the early 2000s, Roberto's culinary chops brought him to the U.S. His restaurant, Keste, is touted as serving some of the best pizza in New York City. Did you ever think that you would end up in food one day? Never. Never. Also, when I first arrived over here, like I come in like New York for learn English, mm -hmm. I never imagined. So the only option for me to to know my father or to understand what he was doing is stay with him. This is why I started to make pizza. So Georgia moved to the States to reconnect with her father. Georgia was the only woman assembling pies in the kitchen, so she was motivated to prove she belonged. And also everybody, all the co-workers was make fun of me because Why? I was, because I don't know how to make pizza. I don't cook at home. So yeah. you're like, I'll show you. She shadowed her father for three years, but Roberto wanted his daughter to train harder. He sent her to Naples to study with his former mentor. She was the only female apprentice in her class. What were the responses from the other people that were learning alongside you, those men. So like they don't they don't feel that I can do like I can be successful or I can be or you know reach a high level of you know be a pizza maker because they say oh one day you have kids so you stay home. Did you ever respond to them or did you just ignore them? I ignore my pizza 
is my business card. Georgia returned to the U.S. with a renewed determination to make pizza her profession. She opened Don Antonio with her father in 2012. When did you have that spark where you realized, oh my goodness, this is what I'm going to do for my career? When uh, I opened Don Antonio. So, okay. And uh, I was really in charge of everything in the kitchen. By that moment, I say, I need to be the best. There's this term going around right now called Nepo Baby, where it's the concept oh, yeah. of nepotism. But you have really taken time to learn the craft and do the work to prove yourself. So do you feel like you've been able to move outside of your dad's shadow? Not yet. Georgia says customers are still surprised that she's running the shop these days, not her famous father. You never saw a lot daughter follow, you know, pizza maker, uh, father pizza maker. After working 13 hour days for nearly a decade, she's had to take a step back with her first child on the way. Working in a kitchen, I can speak from experience, it is incredibly physically demanding. Yes. So how have you had to adapt as you've seen your body change? So I changed completely. <laughs> I need to change completely. Uh, so before I was really strong. Uh, I don't need to eat, I don't need to sleep a lot. Today, 10% of people working in the food and hospitality industries have access to some type of parental leave. Georgia is keenly aware she's in a unique position. I'm really lucky because I can organize myself in my job. Mm -hmm. The other woman cannot. Right, you're, a, you're the boss, so you can call the shots, and that actually works to your advantage. Yes. At Don Antonio, I was ready to see this boss get to work. Italy, just like the U.S., is home to many different regional styles of pizza. Georgia specializes in Neapolitan pizza, which is prized for its simplicity and high quality ingredients. The dough, the tomatoes, the types of cheese, and the techniques are all strictly regulated by two associations based in Naples. Georgia used to train chefs with the Associazione Pizzaioli Napoletani, so I was ready to learn from a true pizzaiola. What is the first step? So we start with the tomato. Neapolitan pizzas must be topped with tomatoes grown close to Naples. So nice. basically I crush like that. Ooh, that must feel nice. Yes. The base of the dough uses water, fresh yeast, salt, and imported double zero flour, which refers to its super fine grind. This dough has been fermenting for a full day. So you can see the bubbling. Nice. So Neapolitan pizza, the characteristic is the bubble crust. The dough is cut and shaped into little balls, which rest for another five hours. For now this. we need to start to make the pizza. This is semolina. See the... Look at the bubbles. It's, it's alive. So now what pizza maker, Neapolitan pizza maker do is like just push the air. Okay. Oh, wow. And you can see all of that air is pushing out to create that crust. You can try. Yeah. It feels so fluffy. After the dough is stretched, it's time for the toppings. First up, the tomato sauce. So one exactly spoon. Now we put basil, pecorino. Okay, and that's a little saltier than traditional Parmesan. The pizza is finished with a hefty handful of mozzarella and a generous drizzle of fruity extra virgin olive oil. Then it's ready for the oven. And that's it. I love it. Ready to go. To the oven. The key to a stellar Neapolitan pizza is an incredibly hot wood-burning oven. This one, brought over from Italy, burns at a scorching 900 degrees. So it only takes two minutes for the pies to cook. There we go. Wow. This is your pizza. This is stunning. God. Cheers. Cheers. Oh my goodness. Wow. This is the crust that you want on the bottom. Like thin, but you have the crunchy also. I cannot handle how much flavor is in such simplicity. I am in heaven.
At Don Antonio in New York City, I couldn't wait to try Giorgia's award-winning Montanara, a fried pizza. Fried pizza is one of the oldest pizza. It was invented, created in Naples. And no you can find way. It. Yes. Wow, I had no idea. So if you see the movie with the Sofia Loren, uh -huh. the gold of Naples, okay. she was fried on the street. Women are tied to fried pizza. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, so the women in the Naples uh, try to help and sustain the family. They were right. really poor, poor mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. So they start to fry and sell on the street. The okay, pizza. amazing. So and it really all started with the women. Let's yes. not forget that. Yes. <laughs> Georgia fries the same traditional dough to a golden brown. Then she tops it with tomato sauce, pecorino, basil, and smoked buffalo mozzarella. To get that gooey melted cheese, she finishes the pie in the oven for less than a minute. Wow, it looks so puffy. It almost looks like focaccia. It's the most delicious and simple. You got that crispy crust on the outside but you're still getting such a doughy, light, fluffy center. You need to try at least one time in your life. Absolutely, are you kidding? I had no idea that this exists. Despite her success, Georgia knows there's still a long way to go when it comes to representation in the pizza world. In 2019, she helped co-found Women in Pizza, an organization that helps support and connect chefs, restaurant owners, and food entrepreneurs. Two of George's closest friends from the group stopped by Don Antonio. The friendship that we create is more really tight, much deeper friendship that you can create in the pizza world. Alexandra Mortati was inspired to start the group after talking to many women in the restaurant world with shared experiences. Alexandra, you've talked about how women are often hidden in pizza shops. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think a lot of times women get slotted into roles that people think they're best fit for. Mm -hmm. Because you're a woman, maybe you seem more nurturing, they want to put you in management. Or maybe you're really good with people, they want to put you as the hostess or somewhere in the front. But what you might be interested in is making the pizza. And you have to fight a lot harder for them to give you that space to prove yourself. Nicole Russell, a pizza maker who hosts the show Pizza Wars, agrees. Women just have different challenges and different barriers to entry than the average guy. And it's like, you know, one thing about being in Women in Pizza is that a lot of times when we do the show demos, I'll be the only woman with all the guys. And they're just so dominant and like, you know, we're all so passionate about making right. pizza, you know? And we all can't wait to just make the pizza. But sometimes you just gotta, uh, uh get out the way, you know what I mean? So I think it's important that, you know, you always hear about a grandma slice, but actually you see a grandma representation. Yeah. <laughs> like you hear the grandma slice, but where's the grandma? Where is the grandma? Right, yeah. right, Nona's at home, right? Well, bring Nona out. Yes. So that's what Women in Peace is kind of about. All love, but just showcasing more, you know, how much women are a force in this industry. And I think now there's a lot more room where men are mentoring younger women and women are mentoring younger women um, and empowering them. And it wouldn't be possible without women like Georgia and Nicole. Cheers, ladies. Cheers. 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 Women in pizza. Women in pizza. Yeah, to women in pizza.
Where I live in the Big Apple, there are plenty of incredible pizza restaurants with pretty much every type of slice you can imagine. But there's a surprising place down south where folks are really flipping out for something special. I want to be throwing dough. I want to be covered in flour and pizza sauce. It's kind of like my serenity. Welcome to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the famed Route 66 runs right into the historic downtown. This city is known for its Art Deco buildings and world-class museums dedicated to music legends Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan. But unlike many visitors, I'm not here to dive into memorabilia. I'm here to meet Tara Hatton, a rising star on the national pizza scene. Oh my gosh, it's so good to finally meet you. Yeah. I'm obsessed with the door, master of this domain, <laughs> Tara Haddon. That's, that's epic, I love it. <laughs> Look at this beautiful restaurant. So we're just kind of a late 80s, early 90s themed pizzeria. That's what we love as okay. a 90s baby. I, I'm all here for it. <laughs> and you're a 90s baby as well. Barely. 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 At 26 years old, Tara already owns two locations of Zaza's Pizza and Wings, a brand she founded. The name is a nod to the infamous Joey Zaza from The Godfather Part 3. Here, Tara is putting her own spin on a classic pizza shop with some very non-traditional offerings. So these are all of our slice pies. We'll usually keep like the basics and stuff that people come in to try, like of course pepperoni, cheese, right. sausage. And then we kind of have some of our weird stuff going on, of course. Pickles. Our pickle pie, and believe it or not, is one of our best-selling pizzas. No way. Tara started working in pizza when she was 16, honing her skills at local pizzerias before meeting her mentor, Mike Bausch of Andalini's Pizza, a small pizza empire in Tulsa. Mike and his brother were in and out of the restaurants all the time, and he came in and he saw me throwing dough, and every time he came in, that's what he saw me doing. So he was like, I, you're good at this, aren't you? I'm like, mm. Good was an understatement. Mike recognized that Tara had a natural talent for throwing dough, so he started teaching her some basic acrobatic tricks. Yup, this is a real sport. Professional pizza acrobats spin, toss, and twirl dough at competitions around the world. During three to five minute choreographed routines, they're judged on the number of tricks they perform and their difficulty. One of the most well-known pizza competitions is the Pizza Games at Las Vegas' Pizza Expo, where pros from around the globe gather each spring. This year, Tara is competing in her fifth games. As usual, she'll be one of the only female competitors. How did you even learn what <laughs> pizza throwing was? I saw this guy that I worked with at like my first ever pizzeria kind of doing it, and they had told me about Pizza Expo. And at that time, it was just like a dream to go to Pizza Expo. Tara has come a long way since a disappointing last place finish at her first pizza games. Reflecting on that time, she says her head and heart were elsewhere grieving the loss of her mother, the woman who sparked her love for cooking as a child. I just kind of fell into like making food and stuff at home with my mom. Her, my grandma, long line of like women who cook and making recipes and that was kind of what we would leave like down to our kids where right. it's just cookbooks. When Tara returned to Vegas the following year, she had a new purpose. I made the reason I was going there worth everything that I kind of put into it. When I placed first in the preliminaries, it was such like a powerful moment. It actually fell on the anniversary of when she had passed away. So I was like, oh my gosh, like this is because of you, like you helped me. <laughs> yeah. And it was kind of at that moment where I was like, everything is like paid off. When Tara's not wowing crowds, she's busy making some of Tulsa's most unique pizzas. So we headed to her prep kitchen where 500 pounds of dough gets made into over 1,000 pies every day. So our dough, we're gonna start with a local uh, milled flour. And then we of course got our yeast, salt, and olive oil. Great. Best way to kind of start dough is by activating the yeast. Okay. So we usually activate it in some hot water, warm water, like 101 is usually ideal. It's gonna smell really nice in here very soon. Yes. So give it a whisk. Great. And then once we kind of wake the yeast up in here, we're gonna put it to sleep in some ice water. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> it's cold. That's how you check your pain pollen. Yeah, exactly. You know? It's funny that the whole point of this is to put the yeast to sleep when I'm feeling 
more awake than ever with how cold this is on my fingers. Now this is pretty bubbly, so we got a nice little foamy layer in there. And then we'll just throw this in with our flour. We already got some dough that's been mixing this morning. The dough Tara uses for tricks doesn't have any yeast, so it stays dense like Play-Doh. Back at Zaza's, it was time to learn some tossing tricks Woo! with a few new friends. Good job, good job, guys. Each month, Tara holds a pizza making you. and throwing class for kids and parents at her shop. I'm a little older than her typical student, but I could not wait to join in on the fun. We're gonna take it across our, our body. Okay. And then throw it up. <laughs> and then throw it up in the air. Yeah, just like that. One, two, three. <laughs> I just kind of spin it like on my finger, like like my knuckles almost. Okay. Well, you have to get it going first. Yeah. Right? The best trick I show people okay. that's pretty easy is throwing it behind your shoulder. Okay. If show you me that. put your arm out, you know, like in a little teapot, short stout, okay. you know, and then you just look that way and throw it. It's like doing a cartwheel. I didn't. <laughs> it's not around around the shoulder. <laughs> Just like effortless. She's effortless. She's a world champion. With the competition in Vegas fast approaching, I joined Tara and her mentor Mike for a practice session. Pleasure to meet you. Mike, you're the whole reason why Tara got into this. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I'm a dork for pizza and her dorkage has just latched on to us and it's exciting. It's about the love of pizza making and this is a representation of that. So are we <laughs> gonna get a chance to see the full routine right now? I mean, I guess. I guess we can do it. Oh my gosh. Tara uses silicone doughs to practice. They create the feel of acrobatic pizza dough without the floury mess. Transitioning from hand to hand is what will give her more points. Okay. And then going behind the back seamlessly. Some people will really lean into one trick and try and make it last 30 seconds. Okay. She's going a trick per second. Oh, oh. There it is. Okay, That's the Terra that Classic. Is. That's her signature move. Unbelievable. <laughs> Bye, girl. Woo! There you go. Here at Zaza's Pizza in Tulsa, pizza acrobat Tara Hatton is making waves with her signature moves and unique pies. I couldn't wait to make one of her fan favorites, a chicken and waffle pizza. So you're essentially taking the Zaza's pizza and wings and you're creating a, a child with them of <laughs> chicken and waffle pizza. Yes, <laughs> they're all my precious pizza baby. We love, we love. This pizza uses a blend of margarine and butter as a base on top of the olive oil. So this doesn't have a sauce on it, does it? No, it's just gonna be like the oil on the butter. Okay, the so. olive oil is just gonna be like a sheen to protect the dough itself. And then the butter will kind of melt and create these little soup pools that'll be perfect for when we put our waffles on. And it'll just like soak up all that butter. Baby, and baby is speaking my delicious. language. With our buttery base ready, Tara and I add boneless chicken wings and moth cheese. Then it was time for something sweet. 
Our secret little ingredient. We're gonna add yes, some syrup before. Yes, look at this. It's so wrong, it's right. <laughs> so a little bit of a Just swirl. A little swirl. So it kind of bakes into the base and stuff and almost like caramelizes on there. The pizza bakes at 555 degrees until the crust turns golden brown before the final topping. It's smelling so good in here. It smells breakfast. like breakfast. <laughs> Jinx. Oh, we can't Wait, forget the Mike's Hot The most honey. important part. Drizzle me timbers. Pizza time. Cheers. After. Cheers. So you get a combination of crunch and fluff with a little bit of that salty cheese. And, and then, then it's the, just hot. And then the hot honey. It's good. It slaps. <laughs> Of course, I couldn't leave Zaza's without trying the famous pickle pizza. I could see a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle eating this right now. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers with your hot slice of pizza. Oh my gosh. It's got that punchy vinegar pickle taste and the cheese mellows it out. I never knew that a pickle on a pizza would work so well. It does. I don't like pineapple on pizza, but like pickle on pizza, mm -hmm. that's my move. Before heading back to New York, I had one more pizza party to attend. My friend and owner of Zaza's Pizza Wings, Tara Hatton. Tara's routine wowed friends and fans of all ages who came to wish her well before the big competition. taking it all the way back to where you first began in the kitchen with your mom and grandma mm -hmm. to where you are today. If they could see you now, what do you think they would say? I would like to say that they are definitely proud. I don't think they would expect what I'm doing now compared to where my like original game plan was in life. I think they would realize it's not just pizza to me. It is my life, it is my world, and I love it. <laughs> Tara placed second in the Masters Acrobatic Competition in Vegas. And she can't wait to come back and compete for the title again next year. Pizza is the ultimate comfort food. With so many unique styles, sauces, and toppings, it's truly impossible to go wrong. As pizza has evolved over the years, so have the chefs behind this iconic Italian staple. Whether they're cooking pies, running front of house, or going all out on stage, the women making pizza today are creating more space at the table for everyone. Mm. The rush of the water, the thrill of the catch. For many, fishing isn't just a hobby or a career, it's a lifestyle. In the U.S., women account for roughly 10% of commercial fishermen, but they've long played a vital role in the global seafood industry. I'm Elena Besser. As a chef, recipe developer, and content creator, I'm always hungry to learn more about the people who keep our food systems running. So I'm heading out to meet two women making waves in the fishing world and creating more space for everyone at the table.